good morning kevin uh, i hope many of us are uh, are, are familiar, familiar with kevin but uh, for those who are unfamiliar about about him and his work he is an ac- architect and an academic drawing from graduate and post graduate degrees in architecture and art uh, united states kevin established small pro- and has over various periods in his life be illustrating teaching and copywriting he has presented papers on building technology at harvard university and lectured in the architectural department at mit while in the united states kevin worked in architectural practices both on the east and west coasts and studied closely with the aga khan foundation earning awards of research grants and fellowships to italy now i would like to hand over the platform to kevin thank you thank you very much sai really appreciate the introduction let me share my screen here <clears throat> Okay. Well, about 9 years ago, 9 10 years ago, I was asked to do a I was given a commission for a house. And this house um was on well, it was entered on a on a slightly lower level and there was a, a bit of a break in the mid piece of land which which rose about 2 feet. And and so I thought it was a wonderful way of creating a threshold for the entrance without having to remove earth or cut it. I I raised the level of the Uh, entry uh, 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 the, the living area um i kept it 2 feet higher and i made a, a vestibule where you could take your shoes off uh, and and put your shoes back on a kind of a threshold between the sacred and the profane between inside and outside and and this little behind that you can see the screen uh, the doors there there's a smaller door the whole big door opens out swings open during the festivals during the raya because it's a it's a muslim family and and when that was built the door was already put in the walls were the finishes already in place the client came along and said we want to put in a handicapped access ramp and and, and it was just the worst one of the worst afternoons i've ever had because the moment the space isn't very wide it's just about 9 feet wide it's about 2.7 meters the moment you put in a handicapped access ramp on one side or the other or the middle wherever you decide to it begins to resemble a loading dock and never mind the fact that i already used finishes which already drew a resemblance to that anything that was that was a 3 feet wide and shaped like a ramp would just render this whole space completely you know utilitarian and awful so it began a whole investigation and i started with drawings as to how i could stick in a ramp incorporated into the seating bench that i hadn't built yet that would operate as a handicapped access ramp when i wanted and disappear when i did it so I had to take very very accurate dimensions of the whole space of the space behind which was underneath the staircase going up because that's where I already intended to put a a shoe rack that you could access from outside. So these drawings say if you look at the bottom one on the bottom left you can see the wall with a slab and where I'd intended the shoe rack to come in shoes get stacked on the inside and you know anyone family member only wears a maximum of 5 shoes consistently at any one time and that's where they were to take them out right? I had to convert that somehow without removing the shoe rack because that's where it was originally meant to be into something that also housed a mechanism for a ramp and also supported the bench which was supposed to have been bought I don't know from some timber but then I decided it needed to be out of steel and so it began a whole series of drawings with dimensions everything at the bench to almost 6 mm which is about a quarter of an inch blah 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 that you can see the the way the ramp would the, the well the 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 shoe bench would uh, uh slope to allow the ramp to operate when it's in operation and you can see that the top is like you can see the teeth up there but it's because i uh, up stands in order for the so the, the actually the lower part is where the the wheels of the wheelchair run anyway to cut a long story short that's the bench that was built the the and as a, a perforated uh, um a seating uh, uh, a seat on top so that you know you don't burn your bum on on, on solid steel in the morning when the sun series hits it there's a huge hinge on on the on the outside leading edge which the perforated seat kind of covers over to lend it a bit of respectability and the fork tongues inside there's just a series of 1 2 3 uh, uh sheets of metal which fold into each other uh, um and attach via the the uh, the hinge on the outside edge and this leg kind of does a can can it swings out from the inside uh, all the way right angled and then it folds down and then you and you from the inside you lower the outer edge of that bench from its arm and then you fold the seat up and then you fold the bottom panels out and then it becomes a handicapped access ramp 
and uh, the carrier walks in the middle while the wheels run on either side of it. And when it's all done, you just fold it back up and it becomes a bench again. Mm. Yeah. Um, at about the same time, possibly a year earlier, I was invited to, um, I was invited to participate in, in, a, in, a, in a global event called the relaunch of the Hallingdal 65. Now, the, it, it resulted in something I called the Kvadrat Chase, Chase Long. And, and Kvadrat is a company, a Danish company that's responsible for, re for upholstering all the iconic Danish masterpieces, right? By, by Arnish, Arne, Arne Jakobsen and, 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 and Hans Wagner and all that, the bear chair, the swan chair, you know. The, and the, one of the most iconic fabrics was something called the, the, Hallingdal, the Hallingdal 65. It was designed by Nana Dietzel back in 1965. And for the relaunch of this iconic fabric, they invited about 30 odd architects and designers, interior designers from around the world to design a piece of furniture that would incorporate in some manner or fashion a swatch of this fabric or be entirely clad in it, whatever. And it really bothered me because you know, I don't particularly care for the word icon to start with. I think it's, 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 it's been adopted in an absolute wrong way. Uh, globally. So I started a letter to tell them, look, you know, I don't design furniture. I, I'm an architect and, you know, it'd be better given to someone else. And halfway through, I thought I came, what I, I stumbled on what I thought would be a brilliant idea, right? Clever me. I, I thought that where, whereas fabrics, when they're upholstered over a piece of furniture, end up looking like the furniture, I thought since, you know, the commission required us to take on some of the uh, nuance and sensibilities of whichever country we are from, I thought how wonderful if, if whatever I designed took on the shape of the fabric instead. And in Malaysia, what happens is that the, the, the not very good selling uh, rolls stay huge and really thick right at the bottom. The popular fabrics are really light on top. Now with the, with the, with the, with the heavier rolls, what happens is that the loose end gets held on the tabletop and the big roll gets rolled off of it, right? But with the light, the lights are very popular, the iconic fabrics, which get sold really quick, what happens is the trader will hold a loose end in one hand and instead of rolling it out on the table, kind of give the, the, the roll a toss because it's light enough and he'll catch it mid, mid air, right? To show you what it looks like before laying it down. I thought how cool it would be if a photographer took, took a photograph of that roll in mid flight and whatever image that was captured that was obviously looking like a fabric became the chair. So my chaise long became inspired by the form of what sensibilities I sort of uh, shoved onto the, 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 the brief. So this is the, 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 the how, how it developed. The back had to be shaped nicely enough. The excess fabric got, got rolled into this uh, drum at the bay and then at the bottom there was stainless steel feet to hold it off the ground so the fabric wouldn't get worn. And, and it took a hell to build because I knew I couldn't do it. I only had about six months to do it. It was impossible to prototype with fiberglass, which is what it should have been. So I thought I'd play a little dark joke on, on you know, you know how iconic fabrics have to, uh, iconic things have to bear the gravity of their reputation. I thought, how wonderful if I made something so absolutely heavy, it'll be a nightmare to drag around. So I made it a sheet steel, six millimeters thick, weighing about 140 kilograms. And, uh, and I got the fabric from them. They sent me this huge roll of the Hallingdahl 65 in my prescribed gray and I, uh, we got it welded, stamping on it in order to get the desired shape for the back. It had to be comfortable, whatever the cost, and then, and then I had it upholstered, about two feet wide, and um, there was a little bit of a chamfer where a bit of foam was put in to make it more comfortable, and then some details of how it was stitched at the end to make it look a little bit more fabric-like, the waves and all that. You know, I felt so proud of myself. Look at a stainless steel foot, and it, got, it went to Milan. It was exhibited at the Salone di Milani in. I think 2013, I can't quite remember, 2011. And, um, and it traveled the world. And of all the projects I've done, I hate this project one of the most. I, I hate it because, I hate it because I didn't start the design or the styling of it in this case with a relevant question. And if I really wanted to have done something that was a dark joke at iconic, at iconic masterpieces, uh, in a way of a piece of furniture or fabric, I would have just designed a, a glorified hammock with all the attention put to details. The, the, the hammock is completely iconic, but no one knows who the hell designed it. No one did because it came out cultures about the same time all around the world globally. It is completely ubiquitous. And in that respect, 
its 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 iconic status comes about as a result of its being everywhere rather than being attributed to one person. Yeah. Now everything in life, creative or inventive in life, can be encapsulated in one of these two examples or a combination of both of them. Yeah. They both take tremendous amounts of uh, deliberation and effort, perhaps, to, to produce, but a vital difference separates them, yeah? One begins with the inspiration of form, what you want things to look like, and the other begins with issues of critical content, having almost everything to do with its context, specific context. Now, form is about styling, and, con and, and styling is about how we want things to look. And how we want things to look has to do with the search for answers and the development of solutions having to do with everything and anything involving the crafting of aesthetics and all the tangible aspects of form and space itself. Okay. Now, content on the other hand has to do with what is truly, can truly be defined as design. Now, what's design? Design is how we engage critical relationships. And what are critical relationships? The, the engagement of critical relations about the discovery of questions and the resolution of problems specific and relevant to context itself through the consideration of all the intangible aspects of critical content. Now, one is top down and the other is bottom up. Yeah, I, I think I kind of graphically tried to do that too. Now, design is a true open philosophy of process. It is a true philosophy having to do with questions and content, whereas styling is a completely closed method of an only production having to do with answers and form. Now, I want to draw attention to philosophy and process and method and production. We rarely understand that architecture itself is about these two things. It's not about one or the other because it still has to find tangible uh, uh, expression but a lot of times we forget about the design of it and what we call design is actually styling because all we're looking for is a form in which we can express ourselves. And architecture is actually this wonderful conversation, this di amazing dialectic between the two. And it isn't one preference over the other, but I tend to focus a lot more on content because form has been so obsessed with for the last 500 years, we don't really know what it means anymore. Now. Uh, getting back to the issues of con con content, I I'd like to talk a bit about context and the context I'm from. Malaysia, yeah, it's about this amazing, crazy, violent passion of the tropics. And it's all about huge amounts of rainwater, amazing amounts of rainfall, resulting in humidity so dense you could almost swim to it, through it. Yeah, we've got more biodiversity per square inch of land than some temperate, country ha ha some temperate countries have in acres. I often tell my clients you could cough up some phlegm on a sidewalk and have something growing out of it in three days. But there's something else that I call specific context. Context can be quite general. You know, the tropical band is huge, but specific context in Malaysia, at least, refers to the fa fact of something called building culture. The fact that uh, a lot of our uh, builders, not contract, not main contractors, but our subcontractors and the actual men who get their hands and, and, and feet dirty, the men and women who do that, come from Indonesia. And, and Myanmar, yeah, and, and, and uh, Bangladesh. And our concrete it, it ends up looking absolutely awful, not because they're made by those hands, but because everyone knows it's going to be covered up by a whole thick layer of makeup, plaster, paint, a look of bond, you name it, yeah? So everything that goes behind that, whether it's brick wall or concrete, is just absolutely horrendous looking. But it doesn't catastrophically fail. You know, you'll spit of spalling, honeycombing, but it doesn't fall apart. It's very strong, yeah? Because we all know that it's going to be covered up by with a whole thick layer of max factor, yeah? We've got excellent carpenters, most of them from Indonesia, skills second only to the Japanese in some cases. We've got quite an interesting culture of welded, welding. We've got good welders in Malaysia, it can be found. And also in Malaysia, having to do with also, not necessarily building construction culture per se, but the fact that that nature, the death, growth, death and decay leaves its trace on the man-made everywhere in, in the country. Yeah? Now, this thing about context and relevance is, is vital because relevance is a direct, you can't talk about context and more, more so specific context without talking about relevance. And relevance or appropriateness is one of those very ambiguous or not ambiguous as much as 
sensitive topics that's, that we don't even address in school. None of us really understand what appropriateness or relevance really means because we are not taught in school, which is a big problem. Now, I want to tell you a, a bit of a story here. This is the standard way we look at the world. It's called the Mercator, yeah? And just for a note of relevance, the Mercator was, de was, was, uh, was designed to give you an absolutely uh, flat surface, meaning you've got absolutely straight vertical lines and absolutely horizontal lines out of something that's actually an entire curved sphere, yeah? That's why the Mercator was created, so that we could navigate all around the world and still know exactly where we were. But it, was also, it also gave the developed world the means to dominate the rest of the third world. This is what the world actually looks like in size, okay? India is, almost, is half as big as the United States. Africa is, is huge. You could fit half the bloody planet into Africa, right? So it's completely irrelevant to talk about the Mercator in terms of reality. It's only sensible or relevant and appropriate to talk about the Mercator when you're navigating, in which case you'll never have to actually see it that way because navigation doesn't require that sort of a plan. Now, something else having to do with relevance is this wonderful divide we have between the East and the West, you know, with this line right through part of Africa, and you've got the East and the West. And there's this huge debate. Oh, the West is ahead of us, the East is behind. Okay, what happened to half of Europe and, and South America? Is that East or West? And then we forget about uh, Australia, never mind the fact that most of these guys came from the yeah, West at one point in time. And then crazily enough, if you were to grab Africa by the, the Ivory Coast and drag it all the way to the right, suddenly you've got a whole new definition for East and West, right? And, 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 and what's formerly East becomes West and what's, well, vice versa. And then the United States, which then just sits to the, to the East of the middle becomes the Middle East. So relevance concerns a lot of paradigms which really have been passed to us but with a lot of rubbish and lies. And then I was invited to a conference uh, which, which had to do with tropical architecture. And I thought to educate myself, I needed to understand what the tropics actually meant. And so instead of the East and West divide, we actually have a Northern hemisphere and a Southern hemisphere divide. And that, that makes more sense in relation to understanding what we were really all about. And then you draw the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic sits everything within that band, right? And when I looked at this, I suddenly realized we don't really have a bloody Southern Hemisphere. All we have is a Northern Hemisphere and then the tropics. Because everyone over here, down under, actually came from up there at one point in time, except for the Aborigines, and they stayed very comfortably in the tropical belt, trust me. Most of the people down here actually came from up here, somewhere in a, a place called Holland. And a lot of the people here actually came from up here before they, you know, plundered, murdered the natives and stuff. Of course, you've got the, 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 the locals and the, the Aborigines who live mainly on the coastlines. Yeah, but that's a small little tract of land compared to everything else you see up there. Now, I suddenly realized then that what we have, uh, rather than an east-west divide, is one having to do with formal systems and informal systems. What do I mean by this? Now, before electricity came along, yeah, we're talking about millennia ago, we, we had people who slept very, everyone slept very early in the night because you didn't have electricity to do work with. You went to sleep the moment sun set. So you had dinner by five, you went to sleep by 6.30, yeah? And you woke up before the sun rose because that's what the most productive hours of the day. Now, with formal systems, meaning everything above the Tropic of, or the tropic of Cancer, it's governed by extreme changes of climate, but over a gradual period of time involving a year. You've got summers, uh, uh, fall, winter, and spring. So you've got time to prepare for the coming season. It did mean that, uh, that the, the, the Northern Hemisphere, the peoples of the Northern Hemisphere had to be governed by a lot of rigor, yeah? In order to guarantee their survival. Now, what happens in the tropics? I mean, who cares? We have the land of milk and honey. You, you got a flood and, and extreme changes of weather happening over the course of a single hour at times but all very survivable. You got a flood, you climb a tree, you'll get hungry, you pluck a fruit. You get lucky, you kill a wild boar. You know, we, 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 we were just lazy as hell. We never really developed systems because we didn't need any, right? So what happens when you start taking this into the architecture realm after centuries, I mean, sorry, after millennia of, of, of this sort of thing being programmed into our genes, if it's possible. So anyway, I. I brought it down uh, very simply, we can have a discussion about this later if you like, into 
four basic points having to do with formal systems which were developed in the West, and sorry, in the Northern Hemisphere. You got composure, having to do with the fact that everything needs to be tracked, meaning if you allow moving air, it creates uh, a turbulence, it creates, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word, um, convection, and you freeze to death. So you put on clothes to keep the air trapped. Everything is about stopping air from moving. Yeah? And you also have to be composed in terms of your sensibilities, because if you are flapping around like an idiot, you won't be able to get all that thinking and work done. You sanitize stuff. You've got to keep everything that you have clean, because if you don't, so rust will set in, it might not work properly, you will die during the crazy winter. It's exactitude. You gotta make things precisely, you gotta do things exactly the way you've been told because if you stray, you will not find your way back and you will not be able to gather enough grain to feed yourself during winter. You know how to make a fire, there's an exact way to do that. And lastly, even if you're born an idiot in the Northern Hemisphere, you just need to pay attention to what your mother, your mother and father told you. You just listen to how the form of it, how they describe how it went without knowing anything else and you will survive, yeah? Now what happens when, when we adopted it is we didn't invent formal, informal systems. They just became dilutions of those formal systems. So all our buildings, all our cities, all our sanitary works, all our infrastructure, it's all dilutions of what the Northern Hemisphere developed. And then we're calling it, well, how do we find our voice and our sensibilities? How do we find something that's indigenous and vernacular to India or Malaysia or Singapore? And it's a silly question. So what I decided was to create a, create a, to create a counterpoint to that. Instead of dilutions of that, our informal systems could be counterpoints to those things. Instead of composure, we have animation, we move things. Instead of sanitization, we have accretion. We don't clean things. Instead of exactitude, we accommodate. We just, we just let things go, which we do anyway. Yeah? And rather than just focus on form, let us not be stupid about this. Let us all educate ourselves about critical content. Now, I'm gonna be running through these uh, sort of principles that I developed for myself. I, I think you understand I'm not gonna talk about one project after another like a boring brochure because I've, I'm sick of the work I'm doing anyway. I'd like to talk about it more in my way of, of principles. Yeah, so the first principle, animation. Now what's animation? It's about the fact that in the Northern Hemisphere, everything's governed by uh, stopping movement of air, whether you've got rock wool insulation, fiberglass, uh, 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 stuffing you put in your roof and double glazing and, and, and just even a room. You, you wanna seal all movement of air because uh, uh, moving air, convection is your death knell. Now with animation, you make air move. Now, a wonderful example of that would be the Series 3 Land Rover that came from, to us from England. What they did was they didn't fill that roof of the, or, or, the, or the panels of that vehicle with insulation. What they did was they stuck a piece, a sheet of aluminum on top of the body of the car. You can see it right there with a gap between them. So what happens is the moment any wind moves or your car starts traveling, all the hot air that's gathered between the top layer of aluminum, the sunbreak, and the body of the car itself gets flushed out. So it's using moving air or air to really insulate. And even if that vehicle is parked under, without, not uh, parked under direct sun, not under a tree, it's amazing how uh, cool and ventilated it feels inside. It's one of these remarkable things the British did for us. Now, in terms of the work I do, I do, well, namesake, the safari roof. It's lifted off the body of the house itself with an airspace. The house doesn't move, but the moment the wind blows, the two, uh, one and a half to two feet layer of, of hot air just gets blown out, and the rooms on top are as cool as the rooms below. I tried, to, uh, I tried to, well, I, I design openings and doors and windows in as much and, and as often as they can be left open so that you got rooms from living rooms into gardens, into dining rooms, into courtyards, rooms from dining rooms into courtyards, into the living rooms and into the, uh, the, the, the garden front, uh, from, from uh, um, living rooms into swimming pool rooms, into outdoor dining terraces and then borrowed landscape, and then from rooms, out, rooms outside in the courtyard right into um, um, a library. So in, in larger projects, I try to deal with this movement of air in this a huge uh, uh, car park, which is terraced from about four or five stories. The upper two levels needed mechanical ventilation because the, the, the floor plinths were deemed too deep for natural uh, uh, ventilation. But I was able to prove them wrong by introducing stacks right at the uh, shallow end and the prevailing winds, the, the, the uh, pressure differential created a high pressure area 
on one side, uh, the high side, and a low pressure area on the other side, which is cooler, which drew air all the way through and allowed me to eliminate all the mechanical uh, vents and fans and all that. These are the, the big vents on, on, the, on the shallow side, drawing all the air through the, the wide vents uh, facing the, the east. Yeah, and they're drawn up through this. And in the building, in the building mass itself, I have these huge breaks which bring air all the way through the building mass. At a domestic scale, I try to put, I, I try to eliminate doors wherever, and windows wherever, wherever possible. This is a walk-in wardrobe, which is connected di almost directly to its toilet at the end. Oops. And, um, and, and the basin becomes the handrail. So there's nothing underneath. A, a kid's not supposed to use that in case they fall underneath the basin, but it's designed for an adult and there are no doors and windows, just fixed panes of glass wherever you, you don't want water splash. In, in large lobbies, um, I always make sure that however tall or glassed in they are, there's always a, a, a layer of uh, louvers above to allow the hot air to escape. Uh, if the doors remain closed, that is, and, and louvers at the bottom to allow air to pass through. Um, I never design glass hand railings in, 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 the, in, the, in my country because glass stops air from moving entirely. So all my hand railings are usually done in, in a mesh to allow uh, um, wind to pass through. Um, um, in, in, in an example on the top uh, uh, left, um, hand railings uh, uh, are designed with a, with a mesh so that you can look down to the landscape while the wind is passing through. Above the same, the same uh, pattern of the expanded metal becomes uh, a, a sun shield for the uh, afternoon, early evening sun and also allows air to pass through. Benches, perforated metal, so the air passes through and it cools down and you don't get you know, your, your, your bum singed by uh, sitting on it to put your shoes on or off, take them off. Um, a, a doormat to a house is just a, a piece sheet of grating that you can put your shoes on, which also leave animate trace of, traces of, of the shadows on, on, the, on the walls at 10. And, and details are, are put in so that uh, even at, at, the, at the smallest scale, that I eliminate as much as possible any kind of a interruption between the flow of inside and out. In this case, you know, door frames and, and whatnot. Firefighting, you know, instead of putting another uh, a pressurized fire stair inside the body of the building, I've got what you call smoking balconies in which people run out to uh, uh, fresh air and before they run back into a cross ventilated uh, 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 lift lobby, so that's not air conditioned. And they can also use that for the smoking breaks, you know, make their own fires if, the, if there isn't one naturally happening. Um, other uh, stairways that are buried inside the building. Uh, uh, are just shielded from the outside by, by ventilation blocks. So they're all naturally ventilated, which eliminates the need for any mechanical ventilation. And, and, and lobbies for uh, residential buildings are completely cross-ventilated to um, right up to the, where the lobbies are entered. Um, my services too. Um, a lot of times you find a lot of uh, uh, ceilings being covered up with plaster, fibrous plaster with paint. And, and the problem is where if there's a leak somewhere, water will just find its way to the lowest point. So where the water is actually dripping from, it's not where actually the leak is happening. And it's a nightmare because servicemen will put their fingers on the, on the, on the, on the, on the ceiling and they get all dirty. So what I've done is I've just kind of like hosiery, you know, pantyhose. You, you've got a, 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 bit, a bit of a modesty screen between you and the, and the piping and it doesn't, well, hopefully it doesn't look so bad. You be the judge, the judge of that. And you still know where uh, wind is allowed to blow through, which also helps cool things wherever whatever equipment gets warm. Uh, at a domestic scale, my junction box is always left behind a mess, so you can always see what's happening. Um, yeah, lobbies in, in, in uh, residential buildings just have a mesh to sort of screen, uh, modestly screen the, the ugly. I, I've taken them to extremes uh, sometimes. This, this, in this project here, I just went wild with letting all the uh, um, ducts be exposed, and I think I've reached my upper limit. And in, 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 uh, in other uh, uh, fire escape corridors, uh, this is where services are required. They just run freely underneath the grazing. Um, yeah, with, with round organic uh, food matter, you know how it is that forgotten onion at the back of your rectangular drawer and it stays there and starts smelling the whole kitchen and with an with a, with a, uh, 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 onion valet with a curved bottom, all your organic round material rolls to the middle and you know exactly where to look and it's ventilated too to allow them to breathe properly. My dish rack here, um, designed right in front of a window so that it dries faster and it drips right into the basin below. Um, this larger project was a, a 50 story building in, in Bangkok, right at the edge of a major thoroughfare. This is a rush hour uh, uh, at the end of the day. Um, 
sorry, at the beginning of the day, everyone's going to work, no one's coming home. And it's on the edge of an of a eight lane highway. Uh, downtown is about uh, two minutes uh, north, north, uh, sorry, northwest, north. Uh, a big uh, residential, very upmarket, privileged neighborhood to the east and a industrial, rather a grotty neighborhood to the west, where the West Sun is. So it was one of the rare projects, uh, uh, high rise projects I took on because it was a, a, a rare site, which I wouldn't be getting in the way of a residential neighborhood by blocking the morning sun. So I took on this project because it offered me the only circumstance I thought I, I would not be really disadvantaging one of my neighbors. And there were already some existing uh, uh, five story buildings uh, along that highway already building up to that busy edge. Um, the re research uh, for the project began with a, a, a win an annual wind, uh, average wind uh, report over analysis over 10 years. And you'll see from the colors of blue, the dark blue meaning the strongest winds on, on, uh, on the north-south, each one representing uh, over the course of uh, a day, um, a month, sorry, uh, where the prevailing winds were uh, uh, in, in certain times of the year from the east-northeast and other times of the year from the west-southwest. Uh, the strongest winds from the west south west southwest, which was kind of uh, uh, convenient because it approximated very very well the direction the building was already facing in relation to the uh, uh, the big highway. So North Arrow, just so that everyone's, I, I, I give you know all you student my students a hard time about their North Arrows, and I, I, this would be unforgivable if I didn't have one. So the building took on a form of of um, a large uh, well. I wanted to cross ventilate every single room in this building, which is unheard of, being in the tropics. And, and the way I figured was by putting a, a huge front garden on one side and a big back garden on the other side, sandwiching uh, the body of a house in the middle. And the, the front garden being two stories high, real back garden being two stories high as well. And, and that way, you, you and the, the, the back gardens are left completely unenclosed so that winds always pass through. And depending on time of year, the winds would flow from the east northeast through the front garden and then um, through the rear garden if you were to close the doors off the, the, the west southwest side of the front gardens. And then if you wanted, uh, uh, if you're not cooking uh, and, you, uh, uh, and, and you wanted the winds to flow through from uh, the, the back garden, then you just close off the doors for the front garden and then the winds reverse. And in the other times of during the, the reverse monsoons, the wind direction process entirely. So after a series of, um, uh, of uh, wind tests, we, we, we did a model, went for wind, test, wind, wind tunnel testing and all that, and it was proven it would it uh, ventilate uh, uh, satisfactorily, uh, cross ventilate every single room. It, it got built. Um, that's the building there, um, the upper floor of, for a, a community, well, uh, resident services, you know, swimming pool, gym, yoga, that sort of thing. Um, quite an ugly building, I, I have to say, on the outside, because I don't pay as much attention to, but each one like a huge cave of a front garden uh, so that past wind passes completely right through it. Um, and, and the idea of, of actually making as much transparency and perforation as much as possible. Vent blocks great because whether you've got a brick wall behind it or whether you've got total opening behind it, you can easily disguise that behind a, homog a homogenous screen. The, the living room or the, well, the lobby, not a huge, uh, a tall volume, but something a lot more domestic opening up to the gardens, the parking garages and the lift lobbies having total cross airflow, even the security doors are made of a mesh instead of glass. And then the view from the gym and the swimming pool area above to its uh, pool, which the rest of the units in the, in the whole of the building were just designed as shelves for each super expensive, uh, each super rich client to, uh, fill in the way they wanted. The, the, the thing that was written into their sales and purchase agreement was that the front garden and the back garden, which you see over here and here, were left completely untouched, meaning air was allowed to flow right through, and they would then build up the house in the middle, uh, each unit ranging from between uh, 500 square meters to 600 square meters. And of course, one show unit, you saw a couple of four show units were done, uh, one of them being mine to demonstrate uh, the, the, how the building would work, the shelves would work, the, the back garden on the left-hand side, uh, a tall volume of services, air conditioning, where all the air, the dogs are kept, whatever, you know, wet kitchens, the front garden made up of the living room, dining room, kitchen, uh, and, and lounge, 
uh, tall volumes, both front and back. And then sandwich in the middle is, is everything that you put in the house. The, 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 be the bedrooms opening out from one side to the front garden, open the windows, you get airflow through. The other side, the master bedroom and one other bedroom get uh, angled views out to the city. Bathrooms get views both, both uh, to balconies in the back garden and to the front garden on the other side, the living room, in other words. And then rooms underneath open both ways, kitchen, uh, lounge, well, well, whatever, you have it. Um, the thing about project, was, which had to be really thorough, were I, I had to design close to 12 to 16 different variations of louvers. Storm louvers for really strong airflow that, through the big volumes. The, the, the shelves actually work so effectively that, that I had to reduce the amount of opening because the, 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 the gale force winds were, were just too much. So all those required on both ends were, were one small band of large louvers and then uh, storm louvers with, uh, with real neural handle controls for the uh, windows uh, in the back garden because that's where the winds were strongest. And then the rest of them were more um, uh, lighter weight with uh, smaller, uh, more manageable controls down by the door so uh, handles. Uh, right in the mid section for louvers on top so that air flowed through from bottom all the way to top bathrooms and all that it was quite a wonderful quite a wild uh, trip for me and and uh, also the service areas which i uh, i kind of capped the entire you usually find a penthouse right there i actually put servicemen right on top of the most expensive units so that they would experience some cross ventilation during their downtime lunch hours sitting up in their balconies and then of course up there you've got the well anyway uh, next, next little bit is on sanitization. And sanitization is about how everything in, in the first world is, is clean the living crap out of. And if it's not able to be cleaned with jet sprays and these poor migrant workers hanging like monkeys, then you, you repaint it and you reclad it and you just do something to make it look perfect. Now, with accretion, it's all about letting things go, go dirty and it's about gardening your elevations rather than cleaning them. So the materials I like to use most are the ones that take to um, 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 a growth and decay. Uh, I like using gravel because stuff can grow in between. Cement brick and clay brick uh, uh, ages reasonably well and, and even without cleaning. And so this is like my material palette. Oh, I forgot shadows are very important. And without shadows, you don't have. Um, so some, in some of my buildings, you don't even see a front elevation. I, I didn't even bother drawing elevations for this house. It was just, the elevation is just, a, a, for the real elevation, it's a clear cut, uh, a clear cut line of trees so that uh, the courtyard and the house behind gets the shade and a view out through their garden window. On the front elevation, the shade of trees serve as the grace of welcome rather than, you know, Corinthian columns or some over glorified elevation that you want to say is your house. A shade of, of welcome rather than, you know, a, a house entry. Um, the courtyard in the middle gets totally grown up with the forest of trees in the smaller projects as well as the larger ones where you are then treat, treated to a cooling sink of a courtyard instead of a, an open space that, that you can then draw cool air through the rooms from. Pressure differential always working from low pressure to high pressure. Cool air is always an area of low pressure. It always gets pushed to where the air rises, yeah? Um, in the larger projects, this one is for a warehouse. The, the, the courtyard area is also where I stuck the, the uh, office canteen right in the middle of with, with no doors and windows. You can see the slab over there for there where they have their lunches and all that. In the really large projects of, of a few acres, the entire courtyard gets grown up with a few thousand trees and it becomes a, a, a forest that people can go and have their lunch. Uh, people are waiting for the, the income tax office after taking the number, don't have to wait inside. You can wait in the courtyard till the number is seen through the glass doors and then you go inside and, and food and all that, you know, lunch breaks. <clears throat> um, in, the, in the garden stair, stair, a garden office stair, garden gate stair, I can't remember what I call this project, sorry. The, the threads were left totally raw and, 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 and rough so that uh, um, through the year, over the year, the course of a year, the kind of moss growing on it would take on this vivid green during the monsoon months or just before and just after. Uh, during, uh, it's too wet during the monsoon months for anything to grow. And then during the dry months, everything turns a dead brown and it dies. Um, I, I, I like thinking of, of, of the garden as not something that you put around your buildings, but something that becomes the building, right? There's no reason why uh, you can't pick materials that, that, that engage and, 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 and uh, the garden as unselfconsciously uh, as a, as, as a garden takes to a ruin, yeah? So once again, brickwork with, with a carpet of moss on it, 
uh, uh, roots of a tree, uh, brickwork with gaps for allow water through. It's all about how maybe even landscaping becomes um, the architecture itself and, and also cools the spaces inside because nothing shades a building wall better than, than, than Fikers formula. So materials, you know, and, and how they age. Um, yeah, uh, coming, uh, leading on from what I was saying before, I, I like the way um, a garden can take to a building the way a gar uh, the way gardens take to a ruin, where uh, unconsciously and passionately, so that you cake surfaces, uh, the man-made surface with it. In some cases, it cakes so much, you don't even see the building anymore, and it provides a, a, a huge uh, uh, insulative layer so that you experience less heat. This is my... Um, former house and office, a dining room below, office above, that's the office above, and the front door to, to the house with a, 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 an office there, which is what you saw a photograph of earlier, the threads of that. Um, in the garden shed shade, or oh, garden shade shed, I, I wanted a garden shed that, that looked not only like a garden shed from the outside, but also felt like a garden shed on the inside. So what I did was I had two, two the, the roof and one wall was made of glass so that I could look up this wall, look and see the ficus is growing, and then the ficus is grow over it. And how much light you wanted in was how much you decided to clear the roof. So that's the garden shed shed. And and my my service areas, you know, it's it's awful when clients want beautiful in Asia, you know, in Malaysia and Singapore, we've got this thing about show kitchens, and and then and then the maid gets to work in this dump called a wet kitchen, yeah, and it's, it kind of disgusts me. So I try to make my wet kitchens, my Asian kitchens nicer than my show kitchens so that clients deeply regret their decisions and, um, and that service areas get treated to that same kind of accretion. In this case, the client was, was wise enough not to even have a differentiation. The, the, the wet kitchen was his main kitchen and it opened, didn't have any doors and windows. It opened up to a central courtyard in the middle of the room and the, the, show kit, the wet kitchen or the main kitchen became that whole wonderful act of theater, you know, courtyard theater. Um, this one, uh, 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 an Asian kitchen with a huge basin uh, uh, that you could, you know, wash a lot of party dishes with then a laundry room about, sorry. <clears throat> um, for this house in Singapore, I, I, it started with a different house actually. It started with, uh, with this idea, I'll get back to that house in a bit, of a house I was commissioned to do in Malaysia. It was. It was a house that, that the client said, just, just do every, anything you want with, but I want a lovely garden. And I realized that with houses, the terrace houses, row houses, you know, they're all stuck together with these party walls. You, you have two ends, the, the front garden of which is, is half eliminated because you need place for a driver in a car. And that's the only bit of frontage you have to a garden. And the rear garden is this dirty brown layer of, of light because it's all cramped behind a, a, a quite a grotty service lane. So I thought, what if I would have cut it in half and string a garden all the way through so that your views are completely uh, uh, um, uh, controlled. And then when you're inside that, that garden, you could actually, your garden actually perceptually went all the way to the front wall and all the way to the back. And that gave rise to the, the, the Green Splice house, um, a house without a roof, it, it, you know, the, 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 the mad science of making a house in the tropics without a roof, you know, it's a transparent sheet. And, and it only makes sense because the front door and the back door are completely all operable and you can open it up entirely allow air to run all the way through and when the trees mature the trees give you all the shade you would if you're under a tree and if you had a normal roof the trees wouldn't grow so you need to have a transparent roof so after a year of of, of abysmal suffering the poor client got a shade and and his house is really comfortable i don't know what the hell he's using it how he's using it right now but he, he seems to be really happy and, and anyway these are views from the bedrooms above into the Green Splice House. And then in the meantime, while that was being constructed, I did this house in Singapore, which was kind of like a bit of that, but more because the clients were quite friendly with their neighbors. Every time a neighbor passed by, they'd look over the wall, say hello, but they, they wouldn't be able to say hello back because usually houses in Singapore are usually kind of boarded up. You know, you don't see any much. So what I did was I did the barnstorm house and I, I busted a hole right through so that from the front garden to the rear yard, you'd be able to look all the way through the living room and the dining room with a, a line of windows on the, on the roof, uh, a glass roofing uh, right there so that uh, the trees could grow and, and begin to fill up the inside of the house. So from the bedrooms, you could look, look down into the living room and still get a sense of garden, even though you're not looking out. So that's the dining room and the trees are a bit bigger here. I'm not sure what it looks like right now. Some of you, if anyone's from Singapore, you should check it out. 
for me and tell me what's, whether it succeeded or not. Um, when I was uh, in my first year at, at MIT, uh, there was this um, international uh, lawn furniture competition organized by Harvard University. And you know, Harvard's the, the college on the other end of the street, they're the nasties. And so MIT, we have, there's this not friendly, but you know, rivalry kind of. And, and the night before the, the competition entries with you, uh, Andrew Russin, who was a classmate, came to me and said, hey, we've got to answer this. And I had this idea um, um, for collecting it, so it's fall. And I decided that there'll be all these leaves completely filling every street in, in Cambridge and Boston. And I thought, what if we go to collect enough of these leaves, put it into a bean bag, so you had a leaf bag instead of a bean bag, you know? But it didn't work. It failed because the chicken wire that was supposed to be the bag material, the upholstery, developed some sharp little bits and, and that it would poke your skin. And I, I realized really quickly that we needed to collect enough leaves to fill an entire building in order to compress it well enough to feel comfortable as a bean bag. And it needed to be a pretty big, big, big bean bag, so that I didn't work. And then I found this uh, uh, discarded frame of an old chair in the loading dock behind. And, and so I put the, uh, Andrew and I put the art of, of, of New Hampshire, uh, of, sorry, of Boston uh, upholstery, in you know, New England upholstery, to the fine act of, um, of, uh, of uh, fall leaves. So what, what, I, what I did was I, I got the chicken mesh, uh, uh, yeah, wired through at certain points and, 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 and wrapped around the frame. And then we stuffed it with, with these dead leaves. And, um, and the whole thing had to do with, you know, uh, the citation, uh, 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 read uh, for the, for the, for the, um, for the symbol, symbolic act of, of letting nature go back, disintegrate and go back to nature uh, for use as, as, a, as, a, as a, a fertilizer in order for the new chair to grow from. And it sounded so poetic. And all we wanted to do is make a bloody comfortable chair. In any case, we won first prize, which was 200 US dollars back then, which was more money than we had ever seen in our lives. But that the photocopy of that check still sits with me somewhere. I don't know who took the original. But anyway, we won first prize. So, so there to you, Harvard. Um, um, there, was a, there was a graveyard that was asked to design, having to do with accretion as well. Um, a, a, a friend, uh, niece, Rebecca, whom I knew and I was supposed to have dinner with uh, that weekend, died in a car accident. And, and they, they had to bury her in a hurry. That's a tomb right there. And Jason, her, her, her cousin, asked whether I could design um, the, her tomb for, for him, her uncle, sorry, who was my friend as well. And, and so I went to the site and, and I, I, I started thinking about what it could be. And I went, resorted to my usual materials, you know, um, of, of, of some uh, 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 polished concrete, brass, uh, rather cheap materials with expensive materials used to inlay stuff. And within two weeks, everything was stolen. All the brass was ripped off. Grave robbery somehow thrives in, 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 in East Malaysia and Sarawak. So I was in a real, I was in a tizzy because I, I didn't know what the hell else to do because cheap, I didn't like cheap materials to accent anything with. They don't work well. And so I kind of like stopped working on it for a whole year. Um, but in the meantime, I, I, I told Jason to plant it with 1,500 trees. And so he did. I picked up the trees, we planted it. And in the year, the trees grew and grew. Oh, okay, sorry. This was what I came up with. You see the brass inlay and the brass cross. The brass cross is kind of wrapped over it, you know, like a, like, you know, in a, in a ceremonial way. And this is a cemetery, the red being Rebecca's tomb, the other family tombs uh, around her, with her in the middle, the oldest family members being on top, and then leading the way to a chapel on the other, uh, the other quadrant with a, a, a natural stream body running through the middle. And all that was stolen within a week. My details didn't amount to jack, jack nut. So anyway, we planted trees and they grew and grew and grew. And the nice thing about the trees, which I figured would happen was that you see all that stuff, all that clear clearing happening on the opposite hills. That's because developers uh, of, of uh, plantations strip it clean and then they grow stuff. So what the trees that we planted over the course of year grew to do, do was to hide it all. And then I started carving my way through the trees and started designing pathways, walkways and pathways out of a a precast block that enabled you to weave between the trees that I planted to create steps and you didn't need a handrail, you just grab a tree as you're walking your way up towards the other tombs. So that's how it's growing right now. The new tombs haven't been added yet, thank God. It's one of those projects where a client isn't demanding that, that you know, that it meets a, a deadline, literally. And um, 
And so, yeah, the, uh, we are preparing the, the, the new cross now made out of reconstituted marble, which white reconstituted marble, which no one wants to steal over there because it's too common. And it's gonna drape over the ficuses like a cross. Okay, exactitude. Exactitude is how in, 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 in the developed world, everything is, it boils down to the proprietary system. Uh, meaning uh, all the research and design has already been done by specialists as to how frameless glass is attached to a, 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 a vertical support, how everything in the West sounds like spaghetti or zucchini and it's chromed. Um, even that exactitude even descends to things you can't even see. I mean, if if my father were had to put this together, yeah, right, and this kind of exactitude, I, I would go mad for him, you know. And and how everything fits together with micro millimeter exactness. Well, accommodations of how you don't care, and if something's ugly, you just contrast it with nice paint, right? So I don't use any finishes of my pools. I don't use marbles or mosaics. I just leave them in a concrete finish. Um, in cement or concrete with, with just the brass escutcheons for the lights and the uh, water inlets and outlets so that because brass ages well in, in water, salt water, chlorinated water, in the, in the um, scrap wood pool, I, I didn't want to use, spend my, I was very poor at the time, I didn't want to use a lot of uh, uh, brand new uh, uh, plywood. So I, used, I just used discarded plywood, I nailed uh, a discarded uh, uh, formwork onto it and it just became the gaps and it became the scrap wood pool with all that articulation inside and a, a nice alternative to the, the kind of boring, sanitized, ubiquitous stainless steel pools there. And that gave rise to the board form pool made out of a, a slightly less discarded pieces of timber nailed together, a lot more expensive, this one, than the scrap wood pool. Um, tapware, I, I try to make my own with my plumber, local plumber. We use uh, standard uh, uh, brass uh, unions with uh, copper piping everything that's on the outside, even the tra traps and wastes get uh, put together by ourselves so that wedding rings still get flushed. Um, wastes uh, just have chrome taken off of them and um, shower, you know, one hot, one cold and one mixer. Um, in the larger commercial projects, I, I try to leave everything in as much a state of uh, the natural property as possible. So the, the cement didn't need to get the cement back, drop didn't need to get painted, although that silicon's pretty nasty. But the, the brass uh, escutcheons hadn't been put in yet. Um, finishes, I try to leave them the way they are with just a coat of silicon sealant so that the water doesn't you know, start uh, growing mold, whether it's brick or, or polished cement. Um, these are homogenous tile actually, uh, but the nice thing is when you got raw copper piping, it doesn't feel so, so commercial. Um, wash basins in a form of a trough for a, for a, a, a clothing um, distribution outlet a brick wall behind a urinal with glass in front of it. I started to use paint, unpainted walls for the lower parts where water touches more and paint on the upper walls. And the pipes are now, I'm using a lot of plastic as well, with just the things that you touch and hold and see in brass, yeah. Um, the built-ins, my built-ins I leave in plywood uh, with the laminations seen at certain important junctions. My steel work, I try not to paint over with just a coat of epoxy so that the joints, the craft of the joinery can be seen, just polish and ground a bit, so that there's some accent. Um, yeah, that one. Um, the, the seal columns I use in a lot of my domestic projects, I, I leave unpainted with just a coat of epoxy over it, so that you see the manufacturer's stamps on them, you know, kind of, kind of blue color, blue color lacquer work. Um, mistakes where they're made, uh, are just clean up a little bit, not totally packed, so that you know, you see a, a trace of the construction biography on the architecture, and that's perfectly okay. I mean, we have scars as human beings. Why can't our buildings demonstrate their lives as well, yeah? Um, once uh, that same, referring to that earlier slide you saw, if, if something's kind of nasty, you just put some paint on it. The paint there is pretty nasty too. But from far away, you don't even see the problem, right? If you've got ugly, ugly walls, this is a dog concrete house where the, 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 the formwork and the concrete was so bad but when you contrast it with nice aluminum, as long as the water doesn't leak in, it doesn't somehow, the, 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 vile, the, the viral contrast doesn't make it look so, so obtuse. In renovations, I, I remove the plaster of certain bits. Other bits are just polished or with the paint polished off of them and contrasted against with a gap against a new brick wall underneath so that you can still see the kind of archival concrete quality of what was. Um, badly cast concrete ceilings are contrasted with 
or badly plastered walls, but the paint kind of like helps forgive. Um, I use paint to eliminate uh, other trades. So instead of having a, 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 a carpenter come in to put his skirting around walls or columns, I just bring the epoxy paint up to act as a skirting itself. In that case, paint as a skirting. In this case, no paint as a skirting. I paint the wall to a point where boot scuffs can't be seen against the, the brick walls. Because this, this was a, a detail for the clothing furniture warehouse. Um, other part of the renovations where the tiles are taken off, the, the back wall, remaining back wall is just ground down a bit and left the way it is with the piping contrasted against a bit. And stairs have just the finish removed with paint work on the sides and underneath. Um, you know, there's this thing about imperfection, allowing bruises and contusions of, of the man-made to be seen. There's no reason why our buildings can't be as, uh, as, as human and as flawed and as, and as per and as imperfect as the human beings that occupy them. And, and it's ridiculous to try to make our buildings all look like Swiss Army watches, you know, like something built in Europe. Um, in, the, in this slide on the left, it, it's uh, these little things, are, uh, you know how, you know, we got termite guys coming in, you finish your floors beautifully, and then they drill holes all around the edge of the floor with these 900 mill millimeter long to, to pump in poison so that the ants and the termites don't come in. And then they seal the holes with, with cement. So what I got is instead of sealing the holes, I just plug them with these brass um, accents so that five years from now, your contract runs out, you get more poison coming in, you don't have to drill new holes, yeah? Um, in this project, the, the, the wall wasn't plastered, just a thin layer of paint makeup uh, 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 painted around the entrances to mark between um, unfinished and finish. <laughs> this other project, it was an office for a contractor he was totally upset because the doormat was right here and the floor had already been just been cast with cement. It had, uh, had already uh, um, hardened, but not chemically set. And the, the cleaners walked all the way in and, tr and tracked all their boot prints that couldn't be removed. And he was totally upset by it. And when I came to see it, I said, look, look, you've got floor paper, you know, blue color artwork and you're a contractor too. And he, he was quite happy about that and he left it without having to redo. And another project, I, I, uh, for a house actually, I called the cleaners to come in after it had hardened, but before it chemically set. And this time the, the floor paper was intentional and the clients, the clients didn't mind so much, but they've got a rug over it. So maybe they lied to me. Um, in this renovation, the walls, some interesting things happen when you've got imperfection, yeah? This stair looks really imperfect, but it came from a complete disaster. The, the existing walls were varied for uh, over three inches from the top of the stair to the bottom. So it meant that if I were to cast something ag uh, accurate, you would have all this horrible uh, joints uh, against the wall. And, and I thought the best way to do it was to leave a gap. So every single uh, uh, thread and riser is exactly the same dimension, but because the gap separates them, the gap takes care of the eccentricity that you don't see that change so much. And what it is, is a folded stair. It's actually a, a sheets of, uh, of a perforated metal welded at, at junctions, uh, at the inside junctions, so your foot doesn't have to brush on it. Um, every one, two, three, four, five, six uh, rises. And these little arms are what's supporting the entire stair because each riser acts like a transfer beam that takes the load of its, uh, of its uh, lower uh, thread um, and then it, uh, transfers it to the little arms. And, and in, in trying to resolve this detail, so I didn't have to have the stair touch the wall, it ended up being so transparent that the light fell in through the sides as well, when all I was looking for was for light to come in through the middle and to make it light enough, because the entrance to the house actually happened from the basement, from a lower level, and I didn't want the entrance to be a horrible undercroft of a stair. I wanted it to be lit by a skylight that was on top. So the, the need for having a transparent stair with uh, out the need for awful sidewall detail resulted in this crazy um, folded stair. Um, other examples of, of imperfection, in, in Malaysia, you have a lot of uh, uh, back lanes, service lanes and terrace houses and row houses where the, the, the uh, services, service wiring run like spaghetti all the way through. And instead of uh, many houses, what they do is they, they will tuck it inside their wall so that the wall is beautiful and clean. And then it pops out on the other side, which takes an arm and a leg for, of of uh, negotiation and, 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 and supervision. So what I did do is I just lift them up graciously with just ugly steel arms so that the spaghetti just gets lifted over the doorway. And then when it's done, you just let it go down again, the spaghetti mess. So, you know, accommodate that stuff. Other cases in which concrete's not so pretty, 
you've got you contrast it with a slightly nicer cut aluminum uh, 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 signage with brass tops, uh, badly cast walls. You've got a bit of brass accents. It forgives it. And in this case, uh, the contractor said, look, we're going to have to plaster it because uh, uh, when you cast the wall, you're going to have the, all the screw joints. And I said, don't flatten the screw joints. Screw it extra tight into the formwork so that when the, the concrete's cast, you'll have these little accents. So they did that, right? So that imperfection can be even more seen. Um, when you've got a when you've got a, a, a concrete that may not be very nice, you just get a piping that's just organized a bit better, and then it doesn't look so uh, obscene. And then concrete walls with really really bad. This first wall is just three inches thick. That's seventy five millimeters for a house, and and it's quite intense how undulating it is because of imperfections. Um, for the autopsy table, it was a the table for that office of that contractor. He wanted a whole a table for, for board meetings and what he called uh, project postmortems. And I thought postmortem, how interesting! I'll design him an autopsy table. And uh, he had a welder which was just absolutely awful. He welded with the grace of a of a shipyard builder. I don't know. And then because his welding was so bad, I, I thought I could make use of it to to do this autopsy table, uh, autopsy table where it's just about. Um, two inches thick and it's 12 feet long and five feet wide. And um, it's got a, 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 a layer of concrete on it with a small feet to raise and low and level the top and welding is really bad. But underneath the table, how I, I support is by means of these armatures which support the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tension rods underneath that hold the table up in the middle. Um, other tables I've done have gone up to six feet wide and about 13 feet long, that's barely an inch. And, and uh, by, just by means of that, you know, that, that whole act of accommodating uh, a heavy weight with um, welding. I was invited to do a, 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 a town well in Pakistan. This client was interesting. He wanted me to do a, a new chain of supermarkets. And I said, you know, I don't even want to do a supermarket in Malaysia because they don't, they don't really rock the dominant paradigm. Why would I want to go to Pakistan to do a supermarket? And, I said, and he said, so, okay, that's interesting, but what kind of job would you want to do? And I said, if you've got a, a mosque or a town, something, a town square, you know, something you could give back because you've already made so much money from your, from your town, it'd be nice to give back a bit, let me know. And then I didn't hear from him for about three years. And then he contacted me again um, to say that his father, who had suffered from cancer, just passed away, leaving him the old family house in this town of Sakar to do a, a town well. Now, in, in Pakistan, and in, I think, parts of India too, what all the rich do is they, they give water for free because the aquifers are all polluted. So what they do is they need to pump from way deeper than the aquifer. And a lot of the water is not even pumped anymore. It's brought in from the rivers and then purified and then distributed to the uh, general public. So he invited me to, to Sakar, which is about um, um, a, a day, two, three days by four wheel drive, but a day's flight from uh, Karachi, which is over there. Now you see all that green over there in, in Pakistan, that's all irrigated by this huge bun. It's, it's, it's this crazy uh, thing the British built more than 100 years ago, and it diverts all the water from the Indus River to these two arms on either side, and it irrigates all that land. You can see it from outer space. It's unbelievable. Now, the old town is right here at the, at the, at where the Indus River begins to collect, and the red dot signifies the site. I'm sorry, I don't have a blow up of the site, but it's in the old city, right next to an old city wall. There are buildings on either side of this um, oddly shaped octagon. Uh, Pentagon and, and, and the old houses and it's walled on, on all sides. And I thought the town well became an exercise, not about the romance of a well. You know, you think about the little prince about, oh my God, how romantic a town well. Wells are not about that anymore. Wells are all about pipes, okay? About the three inch pipe that's supposed to suck water from the aquifer, about types that pipes that run from one tank to another, pipes and tanks, sorry, and valves, right? And then you got one gas, one uh, uh, accumulating tank. You got two more sub tanks. You got a clean water tank. You got a really purified water tank. And you got all these hundreds of pipes of all these bloody dimensions linking them all. You know, with valves. So uh, it became a study of pipes and tanks. This water, this this well, and how to put them together so that it would begin to have a certain manner of grace. So this is a site. Uh, you've got the street, old street right here with neighbors on either, either side. And there was, there was a neighbor with some ventilation openings on, on, on the, facing the, 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 the site. And I didn't want to, to, uh, to marginalize them. So, so what I did is I kept the existing house wall with its entrance and I kind of kaplunked 
the town well just above it in a, with a slab and, and with a mesh, so uh, a set of mesh doors that you could open so that you could maintain them from the outside without going into a courtyard, filled the entire courtyard with trees so that the neighbors could have a little slice of heaven and the, the, uh, the public could go in to collect the water underneath the slab and then hang out in the, in the shade of the trees when it was really warm. Um, okay, that's accommodation. Now form and content. Form, form is all about how in the developed world, inspiration has only happened because of previous form or in reaction to it. What I mean to say is the Renaissance happened because the Italians needed to legitimize themselves. And what better way than to go back to ancient Rome? So they took on the Roman order without, uh, without a lot of its detail and the proportions and all that, and they developed the early Renaissance. And then the, the late Renaissance came along and the Baroque, the Catholic Church, didn't like the idea of, of that rigor, that rationality, everything, all that money, all that, 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 that the riches they were plundering. And, and, you know, of course, the richest Italians were also the merchant kings whose family members also bought the papal keys. They were the popes, right? The Medici's, the, the Medici's, the, the, the whole lot of them, I'm sorry, the, the Orsini's, the, the um, Barberini's, yeah? Um, so what happened is the, the, the rich class, the, the, the people that were, uh, ruled the country uh, ec economically and religiously, they wanted to hide all that uh, rationality. So they developed the, the late Renaissance, the Baroque, right? The Baroque. And then when you go to the United States, neoclassicism happened because they wanted to leg legitimize uh, um, order and governance by, by referencing the late Baroque. Now, what a, what, a, what a joke, because the late Baroque itself was a bit of a lie. And then the international movement came along, which was a reaction to that, uh, the hard lines of, uh, well, the, 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 well, the glorified lines of neoclassicism. So we got to do everything very clean, no more, you know, no more proportions and all that. It's all about the international movement. And then, well, everything began as a, then as a reaction to all the rectilinearity of, of the international movements. So we got everything with curves and everything's got a beautiful shape. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm beginning to get at, but you know, form and content, yeah? Okay, examples. You know how it is in, in these uh, tapware showrooms, everything is symmetrical, you, you line everything up and it's so beautiful. Now, have any of you been to an unfamiliar hotel and you're about to have a shower, you turn on the thing and you just immediately get drenched with the kind of water you don't want because everything symmetrically lines up. You know, the form needs to look good. So what I do is I asymmetry, asymmetrically lay out my taps so that you can turn it on, the water doesn't surprise you, you put your hand underneath, it feels good, then you know you can step in. So all my taps are never uh, done symmetrically. Um, the first room I enter into a lot of my uh, houses, it's not the lounge, not the living room, it's the dining room. Because in Asia, food is the center of the family, it's the center of uh, community. You walk in through a garden door, you walk into the dining room, you get seated, you get served your drinks and your food and your cake and your chapatis and whatever. And then if you are then so further invited, then only you come to the inside of the house. So the first room you get to is the, di the dining room, yeah? So the whole act of questioning what critical content can mean. In a lot of car parks, the, the wall, the safety wall for the ramp is usually the same height all the way through, which is absolutely stupid because that's the corner of the, the, where the, uh, the wall ends is where you get the most car paint of all because all these cars are miscalculating where the turn is and they get sc scraped all along the edge. So what I do is I, I lower it to a point where uh, just four inches is high and the wheel is the only thing which bumps to do it and you don't get your car doors dented. In, in Malaysia, we, we put architects put all their effort to deciding the nicest elevation for shop houses. You know, they've got little uh, uh, um, uh, cornices and, and window layouts and beautiful windows and colors and all that. Everything gets covered up with signage. You know, we have never learned, we don't learn our lessons. So for, for an Azasa design, a set of shop houses, I just made everything blank walls. And, and windows are actually incredibly tiny, so they can stick the signage anywhere all over it. And what I did was I, I opened up spaces in between and, and that's where all the big windows are. These, uh, I, I cracked open uh, the, the shop lots so that you've got courtyards and that's where all the openings are so that I, whatever I took away from the elevation gets stuck in between. Um, for this project over here, along the side of a, a, a polluted highway facing east and a beautiful nature reserve with angled views going to the west, I was in a bit of conundrum. You've got beautiful morning light coming from where you've got the worst pollution as well. 
noise, sound, smell, you know, dust. You've got the worst light in the tropics coming where you've got the nicest views and arguably some cool breezes too. So what the hell do you do? So what I did was on the east side, I created a whole lot of steel shields made out of a perforated expanded metal sheet, which have slots in it so that when you're walking in the, in the hallways, you, 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 you have a lot of protection. The, the corridors are all a good nine feet wide. So you can even have meetings in there and the sun under, right up to five o'clock in the evening, don't touch the glass walls of the offices behind, which affords you all those uh, a seated meeting views out to the views. And uh, the hand railings from above uh, became very solid. From below, you look up, and from above, you can look down to the courtyards below. On the east side, where you got a pollution of high but nice morning sun, I designed the, the ventilation blocks vertically so that as much light could come in in the morning. And then I created a five meter gap of what I called a vertical neighborhood be between the screen itself and the building proper. And I, I put in a, a galvanized grating in it and put it through in some gardens. And it's where services happen. It's where on the ground floor, all the services are get brought into the elevators from the back so that you don't get in the way of the, of the trees and the courtyard in front. And on the upper levels, that vertical neighborhood is where you throw in the air conditioned compressors, the buckets, the mops, uh, and where well, people started using it for breakfast because it was such a nice environment over there in the morning. They read their papers, they have their nasi lemak, which is a Malaysian breakfast. And then the maids also found respite during the day when they hung out in that bar, as well as the fact that that's where the pollution of the building meets the pollution of the highway, where all the toilets are placed, the cigarette breaks are put, and then you get morning light, the trip to the bathroom in the morning isn't such an unpleasant one anymore. Now in line with uh, content and form two, you know, in Malaysia, the, the upper floors of every house is always warmer than the lower floor because of the concrete that separates them and the fact that nothing buffers between the hot air of the roof and the room below. So what I thought is what if you could get, gather all that on the ground floor, meaning laundry room, uh, drying yard, um, 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 air conditioning compressors, uh, uh, services, water tanks, and put them all on top. So that you, so that all that stuff creates a hot layer right on top only, and all that shade uh, creates a medium layer below, and so you've got two floors of, uh, of cool air. And you know, laundry, you don't ever wash anything from the ground floor except for kitchen towels. So you know, it doesn't matter whether you bring things stuff a floor down, bring things a floor up. It's all from the uh, 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 middle floor anyway. And then because you cleared all the space from the garden, you can move your building to one side, stick in awnings so that you know you don't get wet and you don't need a roof above. And then you got extra garden space on, on, the, on the side. And that gave birth to the Darwin house, an evolution of sorts, where the, the house isn't meant to be pretty, but it's meant to be more sensible, where all the surfaces are stuck on top with a mesh above so that bird shit doesn't land on your clothes. And the things which uh, require sweating anyway, the gym, the, uh, the laundry room, the, the services are all put above. Um, for, the, for one of Malaysia's uh, garden festivals, I was asked to design a, a, a pavilion. And, and what struck me is, as a public, uh, uh, I decided that uh, a toilet, sorry, by the clients of the Cebu municipality, that's the Cebu municipality, and that's Cebu, it's East Malaysia. They wanted to design a public toilet for their, for their uh, garden pavilion, for the Malaysian uh, garden festival. And, and I asked the question, why do public toilets all look the same? They, they either look, they either look international style with mosaic all around them. Uh, the, 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 the temporary toilets, well, are very identifiable. You've got Australian Outback style, you've got Darth Vader style and, and you know, very modern eclectic stuff. But they all really do the same thing. They've got three solid walls, one wall with a door in it and at high level windows. And, and I thought, you know, what's awful is that inside they're all the same, no matter how cool they look outside. And unless you've got to hide it behind food and put huge signage which tells you where the toilet really is or become really obscene and obtuse, you really, you can't get away from what toilets look like because they don't care about how toilets perform on the inside. So I thought I'd give the, 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 the clients the world's first toilet, the, the, the global bush. But the bush would be, at, well, the site is here, is at the age of the, the, the garden festivals held, held every year at the um, Lake Gardens, the namesake of which is this huge lake, and the site sat at the edge of that lake right here, underneath the shade of a giant tambusu tree. And I thought instead of, uh, of, a, of, of, of my bush, we'd be made of 126 Eugenia aromaticum trees, which are really green, uh, apple green, and, and I, stuck, uh, I stuck 126 of them behind a screen wall 
So, so there was, it, was, uh, it was sandwiched between uh, two uh, afternoon tea uh, uh, deck and a, and, a, and a, oh, sorry, a morning uh, tea deck and an afternoon lazy chair deck facing the lake. And then you walked up in between and then you came to an area, um, a, a mesh so that the grass would grow underneath. And then you walked into a door, uh, a privacy door in between a maze. You walked around a maze underneath a tabusa tree. And then you came to a squatting pan toilet with a, a bucket, a, a, a pot of water underneath another uh, coral tree to give you a sense of uh, security, some toilet paper. Two people use it during the festival for long calls. And I don't know how many use it during short calls, but the door was locked those times. And then on your way out, you've got the two cutouts in that uh, privacy wall where you've got a, a, a place where you can wash your hands. And yeah, then dripping water gives you the shape of the basin after a week. Now, what happened was uh, during the submission of the project, because of, obviously they didn't want, didn't want you to do a, a scene looking pavilion, they needed uh, uh, to approve it. So I, I thought they looked rather bland. So what I did was I, I, I drew a green line on the drawing and it became a seeded with, with, uh, with uh, um, 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 mulching, a seeded line of, uh, of uh, weed germ. And it began to grow and grow and grow over the course of the week. And it became this huge bushy Groucho Marx eyebrow at the end of the week, which gave it a kind of a nice little touch. And then the basins began to look like what they were, and the grass did die over the week because it was all held off the, the, the pavilion was held off the land by, by the mesh. But the objective of the project had nothing to do with a bushy eyebrow or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a bush or, or a pun of a bush. It had to do with the fact that it didn't matter whether it was sitting by the side of a lake or whether it was in a park. The idea of the, of the project came from its privacy wall as a compost wall that wrapped around the whole thing. Because in the end, doesn't matter what architect does, whatever manner of sin they do inside, and different architects will have different things they want to do. You can't stop them from doing what they want to do. The important thing was the outside of it as a screen, as a signifier, a garbage can of sorts for the park it was sitting in. Because I realized there was a problem in the disposal of, of herbaceous and, 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 uh, and a garden park garbage that the division happened like this. People, uh, uh, gardeners went around in, in these, with these wheelbarrows, collecting all those leaves, dumping them into uh, gathering areas, which they were then bagged. And all the bags were dumped into garbage trucks, which were brought 10 to 20 kilometers outside the city for disposal. I thought, what if we drew a line that way instead and got rid of the heavy duty stuff so that each bag became a handful of, 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 of the price of admission that became a compost, the act of composting. You, you, I didn't figure out how you do this, but you have a ladder that the gardener could just throw dead leaves, uh, uh, branches on the top. It began to compost all the way down. You open the door at the bottom and then you've got fertilizer. So anyway, that's how that project turned about, yeah? Um, part of the thing with, with critical content has to do with what I call the, the, the fire stair conundrum. Usually fire stairs are, are drawn this way and, and they're left to the care of a drafts person. And what the draftsman usually do is you draw three walls where the stair in the mid landing is and one where you enter. And only one line that separates the um, landing going up and the landing going down, which means that you can only put the handrail on one side or the other side of the line. And that results in the fire stair conundrum. The fact that you always have ugly vertical supports, you always have this weird jog, a drop, you know, where one railing, the top handrail meets the lower one, or you have to have a gap between two in order to have it run smoothly. So what I thought was instead of drawing one line, why didn't I draw th why didn't I draw two and create a gap, create a gap in between, and then stick my hand really all the way up the twenty-story building with a chain link fence. So that resulted in the fire stair fence. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you bounce against it, it's like a trampoline, and no height of human being could fall over it. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of ends form and content. So that I, I thought I'd just end with this one. Um, it's a cross of, of the revival, Barrio twenty fifteen. Baru is over here, West Malaysia is here, KL is over here, and the flight over there is magical. It, it's really remote, and it takes you half a day to get there. This is Baru itself, and this is what Baru looks like. That's uh, Prayer Mountain, so it's located over there. And this project was located right there, where the old school ground was. Now, in 1976, something happened. The Spirit of God, um, they, 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 are a Christian com uh, they were a Christian community, came down to earth in the school ground. People started talking in tongues. And this is where the school ground was. And they created a, a memorial underneath the shade of this blue roof. It's, a, it's quite an ugly thing. And there are these pavilions. This pavilion is important. You'll see a bit more of it later, that, where people could hang out and kind of reminisce about what happened. There's also a town museum in a wooden building, slightly down slope. Yeah. 
That's the walk up to the pavilion. You see the roof of it right there. And when you get to the top, you see this. And on the right-hand side is this memory stone in remembrance, blah, 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 with, with a, a fence all around and a roof. And for the, the, uh, there's some steps from the, the, the museum there, which take you up past the memorial stone. And the only thing that remained of the school were these steps and this kind of a causeway, which brought you up to the edge of this thing and further up slope to another pavilion. Now, what I did was this is where the existing buildings were, the, uh, the museum, the memory stone and the existing pavilion and the pathway up. And that's the existing pathway. What I did was I located a, a, a prayer chapel. They wanted to design a chapel that, uh, that was a, a new kind of a, a thing for them with a, a cross and as well as a new memory, memory stone, which you see over here. Now, at first I had the entrance lining up with the chapel, which is absolutely rude. So I moved it to one side and I lined up the entrance to the chapel with the, with the bell tower because it looked really, rather naked. But that didn't work well either because you don't want to be walking inside of a building. So I just changed the location of that bell tower. I made drawings were drawn, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and it was made up of not walls, but uh, rebars, 10 millimeter rebars, because that's the uh, material of greatest uh, occurrence of most common use in barrio itself, because it's so remote, only lightweight stuff gets brought in. So the old chapel's made of 10 millimeter rebars. And that's what it looks like. It's all in, in compression, nothing's in tension. The whole thing moves when you bump into it, but not enough to have it fail. The bell tower, the memory stone, the cross right there, and the, yeah. Now I wanna bring attention to this. You see the, the where this cross is meeting ground, it's only 20 millimeters on the base on one end, and it's 150 millimeters on the other end. And this is how I began to do that. You see, I, I reinforced it with a stainless steel bracket with another cross that this cross sits on, kind of like a sword that fell from heaven. And so it moves a little with the wind, but it doesn't fall down. I wanted to represent a sword from heaven because it would seem like an appropriate location and as a symbol for uh, the power of religion, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but this one worked and, and it worked reasonably well because I had to reinforce well, but it came from an earlier project, which was on top of Prayer Mountain. Actually, I was commissioned to do a bigger cross there. This cross was 30 feet tall and it was on top of Prayer Mountain, which is up there. And they had a small cross as in memory of that event. It was only five feet tall, it was falling apart. And they wanted a, to establish a new cross, which was designed, this is the top of Prayer Mountain, quite magical. And the first cross was designed by an engineer, designed not to fail in the middle of a hurricane. And it was five tons heavy. And short of baby Jesus being a little elephant, you would can't imagine anyone wanting to do what Jesus did 2000 years ago. So instead of this, I proposed a, a steel cross made of, of, it was still close to a ton, about 900 pounds. Um, and I had this detail which was built. Yes, but it failed halfway through because the staging area for the raising of the cross was so narrow and I didn't, I neglected my context so badly that in the course of raising it, one of the contractors slipped, yanked on the rope and the entire bracket was bent irretrievably. So when they raised it, you could see a little, a little tilt to it. It was bent a total of one foot from the bottom to the top. You can't really see it in this photograph because it's so delicate, but if the wind blew hard enough, it would catastrophically fail and, and kill someone that's sitting below. So I had to design a fix for it. So instead of a, a saw from heaven, it became a little, a little dowdy angel with tension rods and a, and a dowel right through the middle of it. And it was tension and you can't, re well, you can't see the cables right there. Quite ugly and a failure. Lit at night and in the daytime. When I should have actually built it out of translucent thing, uh, a, sh a pipe and fiberglass and, 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 uh, and, uh, and um, fiber optics to light it. This cross designed with this material would have weighed less than 500 pounds, which would be half the weight of my ridiculous elephant being having to be brought to the top of a hill. The seashell and the sea is about two architects who are asked to design different phases of the same aquarium. The first architect was inspired by the shape of the Nautilus seashell. Upon dissecting it, found it was made of multi of chambers designed around or, 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 or grown around the Fibonacci series. Upon dissecting it, he realized that he could enter on one side with or where the spiral was widest, visit all these amazing tanks of different shapes and sizes as they got down to the smallest tanks in the middle and then exited on the inner spiral. The aquarium became a wonderful object of wonderful spaces and well, looking up, looking pretty much at it being experienced pretty much like a bloody seashell. The other architect on the other hand, asked the more important question of what an aquarium is and realized that it was about 
high tides and low tides, about the sea, there's about high tides and low tides. There's about the most luminous shallows of the Maldives and the darkest trenches of the Marianas. There's about the most delicate ecosystems known to man and the most powerful forces on earth. There's about sunrises and sunsets and it's about the food chain. And her aquarium became something beyond a single name. It opened on some days before the sun rose, closed on some days after the sun set, had tanks so shallow that children could walk in them to feel fish nibbling at their feet. Other tanks so deep, you had to take an elevator 150 meters down to understand the meaning of the word pressure. Had tanks that changed with the tides, with the rising and falling of the tides and demonstrated the weather outside. And, and whenever I'm stuck with a pro problem, I, I, I boil down to, to two flaws in how I'm thinking. And usually, I'm obsessed with how it should look rather than what it could be by way of critical content. In everything I do nowadays, my problems that I struggle with will be about one of the two and not about the genesis of them both. Because both of them are what make architecture. It's this amazing dialectic of counterpoint because architecture, everything that I strive to do is about the relationships between things, about junctions, and about counterpoint, which is about two very, very independent, completely independent uh, 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 rhythms or, or, or musical lines, which are then combined to make uh, understanding of a new way of thinking possible. And that's it. Thank you very much for being patient with my talk. Thank you, Kevin. That was absolutely fantastic. Okay, so we throw it open for questions now. Or criticisms, you know, I think we get yeah, more questions, criticisms. Criticisms, yeah. 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 Okay, so it's Roland Sharp. Oh, I see that. Yeah. For me, the common denominator, are you, is an architect a resourceful craftsperson, a practical problem solver, or what? That, this is a great question, you know, Roland, because we're always trying to define what an architect is. And, and different architects, well, different iconic architects have different, their, their own iconic definitions of what an architect is. I'd like to say that an architect is every single one of those things. And, and our problem is in trying to limit what an architect is. You can't be one or the other. It's not fair and it's not right. And, and that's what makes architecture so impossibly difficult to do is you have to be as many of those things as is possible because it's, when you, it's only when you're as, as many things as possible of those things that you, become to, you come to approach the truth of what an architect is, which is very, very complex. Does this make sense? <clears throat> but, but if you were to ask me, I, I think I'm lacking when it comes to a, a deeper sense of beauty. I, I, I care less about the sculptural qualities of it. I'm more concerned about how a building performs inside to out than outside to in. And so I, I put more attention to critical content than I do to form. And I should be putting more attention to editing my form better. So I'm a lot more of a problem solver than I am. I'm more of a, of a designer than I am a stylist. And I think I would bet my, my, I, my architecture would benefit more if I focus a bit more on styling, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, um, you, MIT help you. My training at MIT was amazing. I, I, I studied under a wonderful teacher called uh, um, uh, Ronald Bentley Lukak. And he is one of the most um, incisive, one of the most uh, inspiring teachers I'd ever known. It's not so much um, his ability to know things, but his ability to, 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 to create enthusiasm in you and his breadth of knowledge. And he was all about understanding specific contexts, even though that was not what he, that was not how he defined it, but it was all about understanding relevance and appropriateness. And that was, I learned a lot about that from, from uh, Ronald. And MIT, the studio he taught, I, I think I think an education at any university is only as good as the teachers you study directly under. And the opportunities they leave you to, to really find what is uh, vital within parameters of, uh, of context. And Ron, uh, um, and Ron enabled uh, all of us, gave us all that opportunity. So yes, I attribute it very much to Ron. Although I had wonderful teachers also in, in the University of Oregon where I did my undergraduate degree. So my training in both University of Oregon and MIT were absolutely vital. 
I don't think you will, I think you'll be able to find great teacher, a, 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 a great teacher in almost any school you go to. It's, it's, it's your task to find who that teacher is and to cling on to them like a limpet and, and learn everything you can from them, yeah? Okay, Florian, I like the dialectics of North and South, implications to architectural practice and discuss. Can I get to that in the end? Because that gets a bit complicated. North sure, and sure, South. Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, the, thank you. I have a question, Kevin. Yeah, sure, Atul. Um, hi, uh, I loved your lecture uh, where you talk about systems. We are talking about systems from a city scale to even a detail of a plumbing. But uh, just a, just an observation that I made, like you are trying to um, you are trying to introduce a new system or maybe tweaking a system um, uh, to the clients. So I just wanted to ask how much client agrees, like uh, agrees to you when you are introducing uh, these little tweaks or little change in the like existing system. Okay, well, you know, Atul, at this point in my life, I'm 56 years old. You know, I don't really look for clients because I, I've gotten enough of a reputation, good or bad, that they that they come to me and they they kind of know exactly what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do for them, which is about as much natural ventilation as possible, about reducing the burden of of uh, of uh, active cooling or active heating. You know, so I, I'm in a, in a much better position now. When I first started, it was a lot more difficult because I wasn't so known. And so I had to explain, I had to educate them a lot more because a, a, a few of, it's rarely discussed that architecture, a, a good architecture projects also result from a very, very close um, connection between the architect and the client and education, so to speak, of the client in order for them to understand that what you're trying to do is as much of an exploration as what, um, say, Amundsen did by going to the, 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 the South Pole, you know what I mean? Or the North Pole, sorry. And, and because there are many things, the, the best things you'll do in your work are things that you may not even understand or know the destination of. You just know that you are on a journey. You have a roadmap. You're not sure if you're going to get there. So finding a client who's willing to take the risk and the, and the, the but, but also the, the, the complicity of such a, a, an adventure is a wonderful thing to get them excited about as excited about what you want to do for them as they are going to receive or explore for themselves is, is a wonderful exciting thing and i think this is what i wait for that's why i work entirely alone i do not have any staff because if i did they'll probably all go hungry they'll all mutiny and working alone helps me wait for those projects and wait for those clients you see it gives, buys me the opportunity to say no which is something that I think is a very important lesson, you know, because we're too good at saying yes. Does this, does it make sense at all? Uh, I understand. I, I love it. Um, I mean, your practice is not money driven eventually. It's, it's fashion driven. So it's exciting. But it doesn't mean that you can't make enough money to be comfortable. I think what's pro the problem is a lot of us, when you talk about making money, we talk about being obscenely successful or being famous, yeah. which is, yeah. I think, yeah. crazy. It's a crazy yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you, Kevin. Yourself? Sure. Who's this? N N Nandika has asked a question about metal mesh for shading corridors. Okay, um, the heat gain through metal. Now, uh, Nandika, the, the heat gain through metal will only happen is if you put the surface of what you're trying to, of the space you're trying to cool, the space of the, sur the surface of that space you're trying to cool very close to the metal mesh or the metal uh, uh, cladding. That's when the heat transfer to conduction or convection becomes really great. But if you're putting the metal far away enough from people's or from or where people are, then the heat is taken away through natural uh, ventilation already. So the metal cools a lot faster than say a brick wall because it's thinner it's got a higher uh, degree of uh, conduction and thereby a higher degree of dis uh, heat dispersal. Does that make sense? So you don't ever have to worry about using aluminum metal to block the sun from hitting the wall of a building because the amount of heat it's uh, gathering is marginal compared to the amount of heat the wall would be gathering if the metal mesh was not there. Does that make sense? But you've got to make sure that metal mesh is not a solid sheet of metal, but it's expanded metal or perforated so that uh, there's a lot more space, air space, than there's metal so that it cools faster. The way, same way a radiator works. Okay? Does that make sense? Ahmad, a few questions. Do all the clients that you design for maintain their own gardens inside their homes? I'm quite sure there are just as many, if not more, who don't, Ahmad. 
I'm sure many of these rich clients have their own gardeners, yeah? So they are lazy bums. But, but, um, but there's no reason why I guess you can't, yeah? But it really requires a lot of leaf sweeping because I grow a lot of trees in my landscapes. But that's a lovely thing. Leaves that fall on the ground don't have to look bad. If, if, you lose, if you use loose gravel underneath, because the grass even can't grow, and loose gravel with leaves on it actually looks quite good and hides cigarette butts, you know, in, in part, when you have parties. Um, how do you manage between security and open spaces? Well, I don't. Open spaces are open for everyone, yeah? So there's no security required. Unless you're talking about someone hiding behind a tree and mugging someone passing by. I, I can't stop that, you know? Bring along some mace. <laughs> All of these openings that the city houses get their grills. Um, openings in the city houses. Yes, it's true. What I try to do is I try to put security, if the client requires it, requires it right along all the boundaries. So that's where you've got the, maybe the security video cameras or, 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 or a, a fence, which is, which is a security fence, which is you can still see through, but the, the, uh, the mesh is so fine that you can't put a clipper in it to cut it open and you can't climb it. So that's how, you know, boundary security works really well for the super rich because they can afford it and they can still look through and it doesn't feel like a, a walled fort, yeah? Number three, how do you work with deposition of dust? Oh, the, 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 the deposi disposition, deposition, deposition of dust on so many openings. On the grills or? I don't quite understand the question, the last part of In the question. space itself, Kevin, and you have all of the spaces open, so there's so much dust coming in, in, in ah. rather more. Right, okay. You in want to design a house in, 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 in anywhere in Ahmedabad? I am, I can absolutely guarantee you, you'll have to design it very differently from how I do it. I design specifically for Malaysia, which also gets quite a lot of dust, but not half as much of a fraction of what you get in, in Ahmedabad. So you need, you might have to think of, of a variety of different ways of filtering all that before you get the openness. So you probably have to dry a lot more in ceiling fans in Ahmedabad because you can get the fresh air. You just need to get it to uh, uh, blow against you a bit better because you won't get any winds of any strength once you get all that filtering done. Does that make sense? Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just have one point on this, Kevin. I think Amod's question about security okay. sort of is pertinent in our context here in India because of this huge stratification, you know, of society, yeah. right? Yeah. People don't feel safe at night if they're not able to completely sort of secure. Uh, so to see the grills at your back as well, the window that we see behind you has grill, grills all over. Behind me, in my, in my space? No, no, behind her, behind her. Oh, my, my, my. Yeah. Well, that is, that's actually, yeah, it's an open thing. And then there's also a tiled roof. This is in my office. It's Understand. in another building. Yeah, Understand. yeah. Let me no, but we have this issue, you know, because... Okay. The, yeah. reason why, um, the reason why grills look so obtrusive is because you make them uh, um, 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 far apart enough or, or close together enough so that people can't climb through, but you put them far apart enough that each individual grill member can be seen, okay? Now, if you think about reducing the grill members to something very, very small and you put them close to get enough together so that Together, they resemble a screen. It doesn't feel like a grill anymore. Yeah, it's Does like the sort of metal mesh that we- That's right, like a mosquito see. mesh. Yeah. So that you, yeah. you block yeah. a little bit of light coming in, but the wind still blows through and it doesn't look like a grill anymore. It feels more like a screen. It feels more, yeah. uh, more, a lot more gracious, yeah? Is that okay? Yep, yeah, yeah. Maybe that, yeah. So I think context was an answer to that, yeah. Then. Mm -hmm. There is a question from Varisha, I saw. Where is that now? Yeah, the next one. Okay. You help us understand how critical thinking can be incorporated while designing and even after. How should the point of view of design or designing? Okay, you see, this is a really good question, uh, Varisha. You see, what I have here is a mug. This is a mug. Now, that's your point of view right now. And, and this is mine, right? Who's right and who's wrong? It's a stupid question, isn't it? Now, we're neglecting that there's another viewpoint here and another one here and another one here. You know what? This mug is made up of no less than 15, 16 viewpoints just to get a marginal understanding of it. 
okay? And we're not even getting into the most important viewpoint, the most critical viewpoint of it, which is this. You see, so the problem with education, the, 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 not with your question, the, the most wonderful thing about your question is pointing out a problem with global architectural education, that each teacher wants to tell you about their viewpoint. And you're trying to argue for your viewpoint. And someone else is coming along, another teacher comes along and say, you're going to fail because you're not looking at it from my viewpoint. You see, the truth of anything is not about a single viewpoint, but about the relationships that any one issue or any one object is all about. It's only when you try to understand as many viewpoints as possible and how they relate that you begin to understand what an, a thing or an object is critically, what the truth is, right? And, and the reason why we don't think critically is because we're not criticizing anyone else's viewpoint. Your viewpoint is as valid as mine. You're entitled to it. No, no one is entitled to their viewpoint. You cannot be entitled to your viewpoint if you haven't looked at it in relation to someone else's and everyone else's, right? So that's what critical thinking is all about. So whenever you engage a project, the most important relationships you could ever begin to get to are the relationships that are already there, not the ones you're trying to insert with your project, but the relationships that already exist as part of your specific context, that drain outside, the neighbor five doors away, the neighbor next door, not only the trees, but the way in which the, uh, the specific, that amazing man who, who serves that amazing, the, those wonderful, what do you call them? Um, uh, chutney, the, the chutney with the with those wonderful, he, he, he's there every Wednesday and the whole neighborhood flocks to him at the corner of your site. What does that mean to what you're designing? And then all the other relationships that already exist, those viewpoints are going to make you, help you design your own project, even though you think you've got your project, it has nothing to do with them in a way which will stun you. Because like I said, the most wonderful uh, earlier, the most wonderful things about any project aren't really, don't begin with the project itself. They begin with all the relationships that tie the tiny, most boring ideas together in a way which makes poetry out of a thousand year. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? So that's the difference between critical thinking and viral viewpoints. Yeah? A viral viewpoint is just an opinion. That's all it is. It's just an opinion. And I don't care about your opinion any more than I care about my opinion. It's all rubbish. It's only when you start looking at relationships that you elevate no regular common garden variety opinion to epistemology. And epistemology is about wisdom. It's about the truth. It's about knowledge. Yeah. Does this make sense? Is, did I help you answer your question? Yes. And that designing, what we call designing today is actually styling. Most of it is actually just styling what we want it to look like. It's about production. Whereas design is truly about relationships. Yeah. But it has to be about both, you see? And that's what makes it really hard. <laughs> okay. The toilet project. How do you manage leaf decomposition? Um, I didn't manage the leaf decomposition. I just left enough space. I think my wall was only 450 millimeters wide. I think in order for decomposition um, or composting to really happen well, I think it needs to be a minimum of 600. So that, so that um, um, all that darkness inside, you know, gets at the, comp and the, the, the compression gets to happen. It needs to be about 600 uh, uh, millimeters wide and it doesn't have to be that deep. The only reason why I made the wall so high was so that people couldn't look in immediately, you know, not even at heads. Um, as a guidepost for design, criticism should not be conflated with judgment. Um, I don't think so. I think judgment is really important, Roland. But, but not judging, not, not judgment based on viral opinion or, or viral viewpoint, but judgment based on a very complete thorough understanding of relationships. I, I think if you are able to look at relationships, you're perfectly capable of judging. There's nothing wrong with judging. There's not enough judging in the world. There's too much judging in the wrong way. We're all judging based on our silly opinions. And that's silly, you know what I mean? So I, I think that, that um, criticism should can be completed, uh, um, accompanied with judgment. Impressed with the adventure on details, textures, how many attempts, failures, small scale experiments go before one to one execution? <laughs> you know, my, my first house, which I'm renovating right now, I, I called it I called it the light well house, but actually I should have called it the crash test dummy because I conducted most of my experience on myself first. 
because it, it, it's too embarrassing. I mean, it's not just embarrassing, it's a liability if you try to conduct an experiment on a client, yeah? It's not fair, yeah? So my, my first house was where I did a lot of my experiments and where things failed. That very pro big project, that 50-story tower I did in Bangkok, had so many failures, I can't even begin to. I, I got to write a book about it, and I will. The client was an amazing man. He's an amazing man in his early 40s. He's still amazing today. We've become amazingly fast friends because he understood at the start. When I explained to him, a lot of what we're going to do is an experiment because I've never done a 50-story building before. Everything changes. Columns on the ground floor get so big, you could cut a hole inside of them and they become rooms, you know? And, and wind, wind loads at that height are unbelievable. I, I, I had to reduce the num amount of opening in order to achieve twice the amount of cross ventilation. I had to remove, reduce the amount of opening at the uppermost levels to less than one quarter of what I thought I'd need. That's how crazy it is. That's how uh, false the wind tunnel experiments were. So the building succeeded beyond belief. In fact, it, 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 it failed because it did that, because I created too much ventilation. It failed. The wind, the wind was driving rain in. The, the original doors I designed would have failed catastrophically had they not been changed to sliding doors because I wanted to create total uh, um, um, opening during a big uh, event or big party and have the wonderful wind flow through. It would have been disastrous. People would have been blown off the building. So, so you know, I had to resort to sliding doors, which would have saved us millions of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ringgit of, of, well, yeah, a, a few million US dollars, actually, two million US dollars. Uh, but the client was, was amazingly patient. He understood how difficult it was. There wasn't a single contractor, a specialist contractor from Germany, Japan, or France who wanted to take on the job of the, of the um, doors. We, we got someone, a German, who was born of, uh, of, of German parents, but who lived in Thailand his whole life, who took on the job in the end, for Fred, uh, Frank. And he's a brilliant engineer. And, and we were able, with talking with him, to get it to work. So there were huge amounts of failures, you know, in, in that project. These are just a couple. How do you take further the lessons learned from design failure? <laughs> the, the most important thing is to recognize, is to be ob ob observant enough to understand when a failure is happening. And, and very few of us, you know, the global culture is, is designed, it trains you to avoid failure, which is the most stupid thing in the world. Because you only learn when you fail, you know, uh, Bhagya. And, and, and failure is the most important lesson you can ever have. So I, I think it's vital to, to, to explore with the knowledge that you could fail at any point. And because of that, you already start designing safety nets into what you do. It's like chess. If any of you play chess, the greatest chess players in the world can only look ahead a maximum of four moves. And that's amazing. The amount of permutations you have just with four moves is so mind-numbingly vast that, that you can't even possibly imagine it, okay? But the best chess players in the world can, can think up to four moves. Now, that doesn't mean they haven't got um, a, a game plan six moves ahead. They have got those things in place too. They just have a structure within which it fits, which they can then apply if it so comes to pass. Architecturally, you have to find that median. And that's what makes each one's work different, one from the next, even though you may be working from exactly the same specific context. It's the way you structure your method of preparing for the expected accident. Because if everything goes to plan, you'll be doing the most boring, most un an, an, an interesting work you could possibly imagine. You will only do your best work if you're constantly making accidents that you recognize the opportunity of to make something better out of. Does that make sense? It is like the act of evolution itself. A gene decided it was not going to replicate the way it was supposed to. And so you evolved. That's why we became walking human beings from apes, right? Even the, the act of your family deciding where you're going to go for dinner, you know? Someone makes a new suggestion. You don't want to go there. You don't think you like the food, but you went along anyway and suddenly discovered a whole new meal, which blew your mind, right? Or, or a trip that you went with your friends. The best things in life are accidents, you know? Even the act of drawing, but that's a whole other lecture. I, I shan't, can't get into that. Okay, what, what is a draftsman without innovation? What is an, what is an architect, architect without innovation? I, I, and you say, don't say draftsman. And I will actually tell you, Neha, it is draftsman. Because you innovate the most 
when you draw and you cannot draw with a computer. The compu you think you're drawing with a computer, you are not. Drawing is the human act of your finger interacting with your mind in a manner so immediate, you feel pressure. You feel the immediacy. No computer is advanced enough to, have you, to enable you to do that right now. So when I say drawing, it is, it is this conversation. Thinking is not what happens in your head after which you draw your thoughts. It isn't. Thinking in design happens only as a conversation between your hand and your mind. And you can't have a fluid conversation if your hand is using a mouse. It's almost impossible. Even at my age, I have trouble thinking with my mouse. Maybe because of my years of experience, I'm able to do it a bit more, uh, uh, with a bit more facility than others. But I still go back to my pencil, my pen, and my paper. You cannot think in design and design critically if you're not using your pencil and your paper. You'll only be replicating what archi famous architects like Bjarke Ingels and what all these famous architects who are very good at manipulating cut and paste are, are, are doing. Yeah. So, so, so you have to draft, draft. And let me tell you, even after you've been doing all your drawing and you give that to a draftsman to produce building submission drawings for, you are removing se almost seven levels of refinement that could change entirely what you've given them. Because the draftsman is not going to change for you what they don't have responsibility to change. Only you can make that decision, you see? So you think that a draftsman work is not is unimportant, and for that reason, you hire someone to do your work for you? You are handicapping yourself. Because I find that when, if, when I, whenever I do my own drafting with dimensions and everything in them, I am refining it again and again and again, and think about things that I never would have thought of otherwise how the, the, the man bolting it is going to bolt it with ease, how unbolting it to change a part that has failed is going to work, such that if that person were your father or your mother, your heart would sing that someone else had given that thought to what work they were doing, you know what I mean? So drawing is everything, not computer drafting, but drawing kind of drafting is thinking in, 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 in action, okay? Okay. Clients, you mentioned about your clients. How is that for people starting to practice? Do you wait for your client? Okay. You see, Amon, you belong to this wonderful new generation of the IY. I call it because, because the moment you graduate, you're going to want to set up your own practice and have your own stable of work. You have the gift of youth and impatience that comes with it. And you can't. You can't because... There's so much you have yet to know, to learn, to understand about what the act of design is. I started my practice when I was 37 years old. And even then, I didn't think I knew enough. I just knew, realized I knew more than who I was working for. And I wasn't going to learn any more under them if I kept on working at the age of 37. That's the only reason why I started my own practice. And I worked for a good 20, 12 years, uh, 10 years before I started my own practice. And you know what those 10 years are all about? It's about this. When you graduate, you've got a fire burning. You know, you've got this amazing bonfire. You've got all that passion from your thesis. You, you cannot wait to get that bonfire out there to the world for the world to see. You've got to get that out of your mind. Fan that, fan that bonfire down to a small flame. Put it all out. Just keep a little flame going, even if it's an em a single ember. Because an ember, a tiny fire, is very easy to keep fed with fuel. Right now, when you graduate, all of you, when you graduate, you are not going to have a whole lot of fuel with you. But you've got a raging fire because all that fuel has come from education, which isn't about the real world. Your job over the next 10 years, 5 to 10 years, 10 years preferably, is to start the wonderful adventure of gathering fuel. And, and gathering fuel is a fine art. It is almost more interesting than architecture itself. Gathering the fuel for your architecture fire is a forensic science. It's an investigative movie. It's this murder mystery book that's all about understanding what kind of wood burns best when you have a small amount of it only. What kind of wood is like tinder? What kind of wood comes even before tinder that lights so quickly but goes out so fast, you need to transfer that heat to something else that will last for a minute before you put a bigger piece of wood in it. Your fuel is all about understanding different kinds of wood, not as a material, as a sensibility, and understanding what kind of fires make what kind of fuel burn. And in your mind, 
you're going to create a warehouse. This warehouse is where you store every single kind of fuel you will learn about over the next 10 years. The lower shelves with a lot of ventilation, where you store your wet fuel. The higher shelves, which are already dry, where you store the lightest, driest fuels. The, 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 the shelves which allow your fuel to stand up, your heaviest fuels, the big logs, the ones that will last you one month yeah, without having to look for more things. It's about the storage, the collection, the, 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 the observation, the perception of all the smallest and the biggest things in the world. Because one day, you're going to be ready to start a fire to warm a family of five. At some point, you're going to be ready to start a fire that will burn an entire forest down so that you can start new life to grow. Knowing what fuel burns, knowing when you're going to start a fire that raises an entire forest, knowing how much fire it takes to just warm a single family, to warm a family for one week without adding another log in that wood stove, this is what most of the famous architects in the world have never learned. So they create fireworks displays, pyrotechnic displays in different parts of the world that last two hours and then it's gone. Yeah, But to do the most powerful work you can imagine, it's about understanding the properties and the power of fire for one person, for one hour, for three hours, for a night, to keep you warm, five of you with your baby child warm for one week, and then to work into education where your fire burns an entire forest and you start growing new fuel or new trees that will become fuel years from now. So, 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 so don't worry about clients right now. Go look for work in a firm that will give you the opportunities. Look for that one person you can learn about fuel from. And don't worry about developing your style. Focus on developing your content, your abilities to think critically, because that is what is going to keep your ember burning. Every once in a while, you just fan it. You don't have to create a huge fire with that for the next five years. Just collect your fuel and, under, fuel and understand the joy of what fuel is all about. And you will have an amazing next uh, 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 five years or 10 years, yeah? Have we gone on for too long? Do we need to, to call it a day? Um, up to you, maybe a couple more questions. I'm good, I, fact, I, I can go on. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Um, yes, the, the screen, not using a computer, terrific. Metaphor explanation, like writing, manual drawing is the immediate testing Yes, of a immaterial idea. It's not even the immediate testing and manifestation of, a, of an immaterial idea, you know, Florian. The idea is not even there yet. The drawing is the beginning of your conversation with yourself about the idea, you see? Because something that's tangible doesn't have a form. The drawing is the beginning of coming to the understanding of what that form means, you see? So, so yeah, yeah, yes. this, is, this, is, this is not what I disagree. I just disagree okay. that it has to be. Um, manually um, with a pen. Because yeah. for instance, look, uh, I have also a, very, uh, a small firm and I have a couple of employees. And nonetheless, I'm still a guy who's drawing himself. And I, I love to use Rhino. And why do I love to use it? Because it has a certain uh, precision as well as, as, as freedom. So yes. I can pre-build the building in 3D and this is my design exploration. And I right. find this tool much more liberating in terms of being able to try out different things, but immediately see how the different parts fit together, especially if you would talk about the timber constructions and things like that. You know? Are you referring to so Revit and about modeling? No, not, I'm not about modeling in Revit because Revit, Revit for me is too limiting, right? This okay. is too technical. So I'm, 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 not, I'm modeling in Rhino. Okay, Rhino. Okay, what I'm saying is even modeling, even modeling limits your ability to think critically about design, even Rhino or all the other, because your mind is so, if you, if you train yourself and your hand to do what your computer does for you, you are doing it twice as fast with, as, with twice as many permutations. If you're training, if you've been training yourself that way for 10 or 20 years, you see, it happens yeah, look, much rapidly, you see. It, it's a I weird thing to so see. Because, because you cannot have the complete picture. Represented exactly, you one, exactly. You said you, you, you said complete picture, and that is one sense you are seeing it. Do you get a sense of scale? Do you get a sense of all these different other properties that involve space and form that are beyond that? That the computer is limiting in a certain extent. Because, no, because, because for the simple fact that you can see it completely, 
and, and the act of design is not about seeing it completely. It's about allowing the exactly. accident to lead the way, you see? No, but the thing is, like, if I make a sketch, I'm always in two dimensions, right? If I make a drawing, I'm either in elevation, I'm either in climb. And of course, I have the mental capability to switch back and forth. However, if and I do it in 3D, uh, I can zoom in, I can zoom out uh, seamlessly and can uh, take a vantage point or whatever, a viewpoint for however I want. So I'm not limited by the medium, much less. Oh, but, but you see, this is the problem. I think it's the ability to zoom in and out with your eyes that, 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 that subverts your ability to think in that other way, you see, uh, is what I'm saying. Uh, 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 Florian, Florian, yeah? It's yeah. what I'm saying. The, the, the very thing that you say is helping you is what I'm saying is disadvantaging you. And it will take some time to get your mind around it, but, but it's what I've discovered in almost every situation with, with, yes. my, with, with, with the greatest architects in the world, with students, with my own work. It is a, it's a bit counterintuitive. What, what, what if I, I can say actually, that I, I discovered the opposite? I, I just want to come in here as well. I think I agree with Kevin in the sense that, you know, um, when you are, let's say even just something as simple as AutoCAD, it's very predetermined, you know, in the sense it is asking you for precision at a point when you're not quite ready for that. And then you settle for whatever this thing is, uh, particularly when you're doing modeling and you say you want to see it in 3D. So we don't have to make a plan and we don't have to make an elevation to understand how this thing is going to be in the third dimension, right? You can sketch that as well. Flo With Florian, these sort of roughness I think it's a very without old the predeterminism. Yeah. Florian, I, I, I have got, a, I've got, I've got an explanation for him that, that might help explain what I'm thinking better, okay? Okay. Oh, I, I completely understand you. Um, there's no, no, no question no, 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 about no, it. No, just, this is a just different, different take on it. It's a different take on it. You see, with, with SketchUp or Rhino or all the other programs, you you are right in the sense that it will help you manipulate the form and the space uh, in a more certain, complete way than your mind ever could. You're absolutely right, but it doesn't help you in what in what matters the most, which is in relation to critical content, which is about design. So you are right that these programs help you much better in relation to styling, but it does not help you think more critically in relation to design. I'm again not, not sure because look, I'm drawing a lot of options, a lot of variations, and they're drawn out um, relatively to a high degree of precision or yes. completeness, not not precision, okay, yes. completeness. So I can't put them next to each other like OMA is doing uh, blue form models next to each other. However, I, my problem with the blue form models is I like them. Uh, I see this also as a, as a, as a tool set of the, of the analog uh, drawing in that line. Uh, mm -hmm. However, you cannot really zoom zoom in and get the closer you get, you cannot get a higher level of, of a degree of, 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 of completeness of the building. So I can evaluate all these uh, options we have drawn, like 10 of them, next to each other. And I'm not only evaluating them then on um, form, but I can evaluate them on all sort of other uh, design parameters, which are, which are important. And, 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 and I know, I can, say, I can, I know you're using the word design param parameters, but I would like to, sub to substitute actually what is really happening. They are stylistic. Um, uh, parameters. You're using the word design in, uh, uh, incorrectly when actually it's styling that you're thinking of. It's a, it's a paradigm that we all live under. Architects no, I wouldn't use say the so, word because, look, design. I can, I, can, I, can model, I can 3D model my surrounding. I can place the building in the surrounding. I can see immediately yeah, the formal styling. The, the, so what the massing. Like, you see? Yeah, but no, but I also see like uh, how the building is overshadowing and I can plan uh, my entrances differently. I can uh, overlay uh, with, with uh, let's say, wind directions and sun directions and so on and so forth. So I have okay, a maybe much more that point. I, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I've been there. I've been there, and I know what, where you're coming from. But let's let's leave it at that, so that yeah, we don't eat each other. <laughs> we don't hijack it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the chicken and the egg. Um, design intuitive, <laughs> flexible to accommodate flaws. We done that. Baggage of their own. Ah, clients are well informed to come with a huge baggage of their own. Okay, clients know a lot about what they want, Bagya, but very few clients know what they really need. And, and when it comes to design, you can, you can argue till the cows come home about what you want or what the clients want, but you can never get anywhere because wants all about polka dots and pinstripes. Who's right and who's wrong? Who cares? They don't make any sense at all. It's only when you boil it down to needs, meaning necessities. If I do it this way, it's going to be cheaper. 
If I do it that way, you're going to save more money with the maintenance. If you, the logical things that you can base your argument on. If you're going to talk, if you argue, with, you're going to argue with the client about aesthetics, about what you want as opposed to what they want, you'll never get anywhere. So I avoid that, uh, that, that, that scenario entirely. Does this make sense? So you got to dis distinguish when you meet a client, intelligently understand what kind of baggage they have. Is it a baggage of wants or is it a baggage of needs? Very few clients come with even a handbag of needs. They know everything about what they want. They don't really know what they need. Now, do you know what they need? Because a lot of clients, a lot of architects think we know what clients need when actually it's only what we want. <laughs> you see, so I think that has got to be very carefully um, uh, uh, balanced and gauged so that you know yourself even better before you know your client. And only then will you be responsible enough to be able to respond, yeah? In, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a proper way, if that makes sense. Are we yes, the yes. Cup? You're not explaining a cup. There are two points of view regarding the role of digital media. <laughs> Argue which is better. Very good question, uh, Vishwasnath. I'm actually arguing it from a, a number of viewpoints. It's not, I'm not arguing from a viewpoint of using your hand and a pencil. I'm not. I'm arguing from a viewpoint of thinking. And, and let me explain it in this way, yeah? When you're drawing with a computer, even if it's a if, even if it's a program that you can do a lot of multiple views and all that, computers are made of a screen, and that whole screen is made of tiny little things called pixels. You cannot draw in between two pixels. You can only draw a line, even if it's a freehand line, in one pixel or another. You can never draw a line in between pixels. And that very structure of a computer means it can only be one or zero. The computer is designed to eliminate any kind of accident or mistake you could possibly choose to make or make by accident. And like a production line of a, of a Toyota car, which have all these arms coming exactly the right split second to produce a fully made car at the end, it's designed to eliminate uh, uh, aberrations or, 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 to, or to streamline production to cut out any possible flaws, you see? But the act of design itself is about a constant flow of flaws you recognize the ability of, take the opportunity for, and then build, which then builds on itself. The only mind that's able to do that is the human mind. Now the computer rightly said, it's only a tool. Yes, it should only be used as a tool. But when you can manipulate images the way it can, you have to trust me on this for now, you're not using it as a tool anymore. It begins to take over your other abilities to think. You stop understanding what scale and proportion mean because scale and proportion means nothing in a drawing if you can constantly zoom in and out. It means nothing. You can't develop your uh, special perception and gauge of proportion, of looking at an object in a piece of drawing and knowing exactly how big it is and how big of it will be in real life, you see? The computer with its ability, its, its facility to do so many things eliminates your effort you need to make to do it and, 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 and enough times so that your muscle memory already understands that. It's like the pianist, the, 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 the virtuous solo pianist, you know? 99% of the performance they do in Carnegie Hall is muscle memory. They practice so many hours that their fingers already know what they're gonna do. You don't have to think about the fingers anymore. And that last 1% is focusing on the emotion of the piece. That's why the Russian pianist will always outdo the, well, most of them anyway, will always outdo the Chinese or the Japanese pianists. Because even, or the figure skaters, sorry, because the, 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 the Eastern skaters, the, the Chinese and the Japanese might have better technical ability, but they do, they forget about that 1% because they're so focused on that 99%. Now imagine an architect who's not even putting that 99% into the muscle memory. They can't even, they can't even, they don't even think about that 1% in which the accident begins to happen, you see? So, so that, that, that virtuoso performance is 99% effort, but 1% brilliance. With, without one or the other, it will completely fall flat, yeah? So, so, so um, uh, with the drawing, with the computer, it's the same thing. You can't hire someone to play your piano for you. You can't get a computer to play the piano for you. You can't hire a computer to do, do, do your drawings for you it will eliminate such a vital part of the process of learning how hard to fit a key, the space of time it takes between hitting one key and the next. Drawing is as, 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 as subtle 
as nuanced a thing as playing the piano. No computer is able to do that yet. And we think we are using the computer as a tool, but it's reducing our ability to know what media means. This is the point I'm trying to make, you know? Um, trying to convince which medium is better. It's very subjective and what matters is what works for that person. That, that this is the classic argument that everyone makes. We are all subjective and we all have our ways of working. You see, opinion. I'm talking about the whole object of drawing. I'm talking about the whole object of thinking, the issue of it. I'm trying to help have you understand the relationship. Uh, um, drawing is, we think of drawing, your, your definition of drawing is a medium. It's not. Drawing is thinking. If you're able to draw with a mouse as well as you can draw with a pen or pencil, fine, you're using it as a mode of thinking then. You can't, not a computer, no computer is powerful enough to do that yet, you see? So, so I'm, I'm not trying to convince you of my opinion. I'm just trying to get you out of yours, yeah, Shivam? I hope you, don't, you understand that. Um, were you, if you were to think about architectural education for the future, what would be the key content or ability that you think are most important to inculcate? I want to get rid of social media, of, of, of Facebook, of, of Instagram, and, and, and only engage Google image under very, very specific circumstances because that imagery uh, subverts our ability to think or uh, 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 to understand things originally, and it makes us descend to a, a, a mode of cut and paste uh, appropriation. And, and a lot of what we call design today is actually not design, it's appropriation, things we've seen before that we are using very intelligent and, and, and mixing well enough to mix and match so that it looks original when actually not a single thing about it is. Even the relationships you're putting them in, in, together with are not really original. And that's what I'll try to reduce our dependence on actually the computer. It's destroying our abilities to think, yeah? Cock me. As the pen is a tool. Yes, the pen is a tool, same, as a pen, same with the pencil, but the way you wield the pen or the pencil on the paper is completely different from the way you do it with the computer. You don't feel pressure. You don't feel pressure. You don't feel the immediacy of a movement. I, 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 I'm just trying to have you understand the, this other complete picture, you know, because I use the computer too. I did a whole series of renderings and design actually with the computer on the big 50 story building. And I realized when I was falling short of uh, this thing, not through lack of ability, because I could suddenly use Photoshop and a lot of the other programs at about 75% their capability, which which is a lot, you know. I do agree that technology does numb the power that minds can bring, that we may skip some things. A lot of things, actually. This is a subject of a whole other lecture, you know. Drawing is thinking. You, could, you can read this book by, by, um, by Johanny Plasma. It's it called The Thinking Hand. And I think it's, a, is it called The Thinking Hand, Anjali? I think it is. I but it's an interesting yeah. book because he talks exactly about this issue. And trust me, if you believe that, draw, that, that the drawing and, and a pencil or pen is just a tool, you do not, you're, 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 going to be, you're going to be in very, very safe company. Most architects, the most famous architects think that exactly that way. Even Martha Thorne, who is the executive director of the Pritzker, believes that. She thinks the computer should have to be taught in school. It's an absolute requirement. And I'm saying that's the dominant paradigm. That's the box. You guys have to start thinking outside the box for a book. Um, just a moment to understand that there are multiple other viewpoints rather than just that one. You know, it's the other way around than what you think. Yeah, if, if you don't, if you don't mind, uh, uh, just bearing with me. So I computers think are a tool exactly as you, and you can't put a soul of the space through it. Um, yes, I, they, 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 no one is going to disagree with you, Sachin, but they will say that that's exactly what drawing does too. You see except the computer does it faster. I'm arguing that the computer and the drawing are too, it's a categorical mistake to equate a computer with a pencil or a pen. They're two totally different categories, yeah? Like human beings, a different species from uh, the lemon grass growing outside, <laughs> yeah? How do you look at the profession under current conditions of pandemic? Actually, nothing much has changed, you know, Bagya, because the world has suddenly realized that as long as global cargo moves through ship or by air or by lorry, the world still operates as fine. Human beings don't need to move anywhere. And the only things that really, really change architecturally are, um, are the waiting areas. You know, right now people are waiting outside of buildings uh, because no one wants to be inside. 
I think air conditioning is going to be reduced a lot more because we find that it's better to have fresh air blowing through. Waiting areas outside buildings are going to be a more design might have been put in them because it's safer to wait outside. So you might have really wonderful waiting areas outside now, fewer waiting areas inside, much fewer office buildings because we realize we don't really need to go to office anymore. So there are lots of developers who are going to be very upset, I think. And lastly, houses for the rich are going to get are going to double in size. Because either that or divorces are going to double in quantity because, because people realize that the only reason why they're still staying together, and it's just one of the outcomes of being together your whole lives. You need space, a, a, a private space for yourself. And a lot of commissions now are just crazy, the sizes they're looking for. And that's going to change a lot. But really, every other problem that we think is architectural is going to be taken care of by a face mask a very good face mask and some hand sanitizer. You know, I don't think we, we need to worry about architecture too much. Yeah, just certain typologies would be reduced in, in, in quantity. I use and use the pen too. I'm trained as a draftsman, still like to extend my tool set. Right, and, and I, I agree with you, you know, Florian, but uh, the, 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 the pen and the, and, and, the, and the paper is not a tool set. It's more than that, yeah? But we can agree to disagree, yeah? Although I'd like to say that I'm not trying to argue my viewpoint. I, I, I'm trying to talk about it in relationship to other things. Uh, okay, that's the question. Those are the questions. Yes. And I think we're getting close to one o'clock. Yes. And uh, I thought we could, you know, this drawing is thinking was a nice, uh, is a very nice statement, just as writing is thinking. All of these things help to clarify processes in your. Uh, brain while you're working. So no, it's been absolutely fantastic, Kevin. I mean, I think your mm -hmm. level of innovation with respect to your thinking, your architectural thinking is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think that is what has generated all of these sort of interesting questions, you know? No, in um, all honesty though, Anjali, I, I feel that I, 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 my, 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 my talent, my real talent is with teaching, you know? And that's where my, most of my work is. And, and because I, I find that my, my best work is with, with the lectures I produce and the teaching I try to do rather than my work. So when you ask me to talk about my work, I try not to frame it as a brochure of projects, but right. in principle, so that it didn't become too boring for everyone. Because yeah. there's no such thing as a, as a wonderful project. It's all in little bits here and there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, when I'm saying innovation, I also, you know, so it's a clear sort of uh, exposition of thinking from first principles. You know, I think your your sort of your diving board is thinking from first principles, and which is why you know the the what comes out of your work is so innovative. And uh, well, yeah, you know. so interesting. I mean, what's the point of going to visit, a, a, a explore a country that someone else has already been to in a way? You know. Yeah. Yeah. So nice to be tourists, but, but it's nice yeah. to be an explorer sometimes. Sure. But, you know, again, going back to the whole concept of accretion, there's a lot of us that build on what is also already there also, you know? Absolutely. We, we can't work in a vacuum, but there yes. is, a, there is there's a reason why the word originality exists. And I Absolutely. think we've been yeah. for too many years now by something that's been attributed to Picasso that, that, that the great, that the brilliant people copy. And, and, and oh. true, well, it may be true that in order to learn, you need to copy as a four-year-old. We are way past that by the time we reach age of five. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. education has taken on the, the ban of imitation as something vital to education, which is completely incorrect. You know, originality is incredibly important and also incredibility yeah. to, to strive for. Well, so we probably got to where we are through a combination of learning and originality, right? Yes. through what has happened in the past so yeah right. no, so i think this was terrific thank you very thank much you so much for everyone for coming thanks a lot for it inviting was me just to very life. well put together thank you okay. so much kevin Have a good thank day. you good kevin day. bye thank you it was wonderful thank you